welcome to the official Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast. My name's Ian. And my name's Nikki, bringing you the best in comics and graphic novels and updates from the festival. Hello, welcome to the Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast, episode 60. My name is Ian. And I'm Nikki. 60? Episode 60. What? Do we have like a party now? Why? Because it's like a round number. All oh, the cats involved. It's no, a round it's, number. <laughs> it's, it's like when you're a child, you know, you get your, you have a party when you get to your first... I'm having a party when I hit 60. <laughs> episode. You know, when you get to 10, you might get yeah. excited. Then it's like 25, then it's 50, and now it's 100. It's up the, the level... Seriously? Before you have exciting... Not 60? No. Hmm. The exciting time has to grow... So, yeah. I'm a little bit disappointed. We're not excited now until we get to episode yep. one. Are you ever excited, Ian? I'm always Are you ever? excited. Are you? We have a cat attacking I know, the I'm microphone. Ha- I'm hanging on to the microphone. Do you want to remove <laughs> I do need said to maneuver cat the while cat. I explain what uh, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to maneuver the cat. She's really in here now. Um, um, so, on this episode, we've got uh, off of Sensible Footwear, A Girl's Guide, Kate Charlesworth, on to uh, talk about the book and about her life and times and career. She's got um, her head stuck now. <laughs> This is not going well. Most people would actually stop and re-record, but we're not. We're going to keep on going. Um, I can't get my microphone up now. Uh, Look, it's got all droopy. Jesus. It's not even me for once. Come on. Well, I think I've got the cat. We've got Tom is on oh. to talk and do oh, a review God, on yeah. Tony Esmond's new comic, The Hawk Chronicles, which we're also going to have a little chat on uh, very shortly. He's have a naughty boy. Now? Have you finished? Um, I don't know. Me, the microphone keeps... <laughs> Who's look. a naughty boy? Tony. Sort my microphone out. It keeps going. Um, oh, look. We've got a, another down. episode of Mutter Downs, which is Pete, the Pete and Mike extravaganza show, as we'll call we it. Sh- just stop letting them talk together. Two hours. They can't. They you just know, can't leave. The funny them. thing is, it's, it's like this is part one, but you said to me, "Oh, just you know, we can do that in two halves for them." It's like no, this is this is half of it. <laughs> um, so they're on to talk about five events from the festival program, and they've got five more to talk next time. So this time they're looking at uh, gothic comics, zombie movies, band censored comics, hell themed heroes, and Belgian comics. Um, essentially, they're saving us a job because they we are. were going to do this, and you know what? We'll leave it. them to it. Do we- we don't, we shouldn't tell they've, them stuff. They've stolen that idea. What Tom's idea? stolen our comic we were going to review. I know. It's like they're taking over. Taking over. Yeah. So, because of that, we're not Sack coming back all. after this. This is it. This is, <laughs> <laughs> there's not going to be a second bit of us. Is there not? No. We're not even coming back? Mike and Pete can deal with that. Oh my God, you're letting them win. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, uh, before we do some reviews, we've got some thanks to say. Mm-hmm. Um. We've had um from Flying Eye Books... Yes. Or No Bad Press, whichever, two different, yes. same company. Yeah. Um, Hilda and a Mountain King <gasps> sent to us. So that will be reviewed next episode. Do you know how beautifully it turned out? It was gift wrapped. Oh, it wrapped. was, wasn't it? It was gift wrapped in Hilda paper. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> um, we've also got something very different to talk about next episode, um, which is a My card comic. game oh, no. called Salty Dogs, which we've been yes. sent to review. It's an now, amazing game. We were, we were, Offered this opportunity because of our previous podcast, mm-hmm. and they they just sent out to a, a mailing list. Mm-hmm. But because um, he's worked, the guy Andy Brown, who's who's made the game, he's mm-hmm. working for uh, Berserker Comics, and in particular Simon Bisley, yes, who is possibly my favourite comic artist mm-hmm. ever. His art just stands out for me because he, he the things he draws is just so vibrant, and mm. oh, I love his work. Um, we thought it's ideal. Yeah. to talk about you know the it artwork links. within the game is, is yeah. perfect so we're going to play that and we'll uh, discuss that next episode and the kickstarter starting around that time mm-hmm. as well um from what we've seen so far it looks really good fun yes pirate card game pirates so with animal um, pirates <laughs> so we were hoping to do that before this but yeah we've not had a chance so it'll be next episode mm-hmm. as a as a kickstart launches we will tell you all about this card game yes because let's be honest we're all nerds we like comics we like tv we like movies and we like games yes what's wrong with that well, some people would. Oh, well, they're, they're not important. No. So it's fine. Okay. Um, before we get into reviews, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. One which I don't think I've brought up is my excitement over the new He-Man cartoon, which I don't think we've brought this wow. up yet. Wow, yes. I'm sure you haven't stopped banging on about it to me at all. It's animation. It fits within the Comic Art Festival program. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's anime animation. Anime, exactly. Mm. So if you've not heard, I'm sure you have if you're interested. If you haven't, you don't care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Netflix are, are, are utilising the team who brought Castlevania 
which is amazing it's gorgeous amazing animation and it. also it's been taken seriously it's been taken with real love and yes. passion of the character um they're bringing an anime version of masters of the universe He-Man. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. He-Man! This is the problem. Everyone calls it He-Man, but it is actually Masters He-Man of the Universe. He-Man and the Masters um, of the Universe. And they're doing it as a follow-on from the cartoon, so it's not a complete reboot or anything. This is continuing those characters as they were mm-hmm. in the original 80s cartoon. It's been helmed by Kevin Smith, who... <laughs> Biggest nerd out there, there, isn't he? He knows his stuff. He, he's going to put... You know, he's made balls up with films and stuff mm-hmm. but he cares about the characters and i think that's the biggest thing mm-hmm. about it so he's choosing the writers who are then gonna yeah. write each individual and there's gonna be different writers per episode he's doing one of them yes and it's just the fact that he cares that is getting me so excited about this project <laughs> i can't wait yeah you've only mentioned it once or twice or well, i've been after this for so long times. you have you were whinging about it only a few weeks ago but she has come out and She-Ra. it's done really well it's not our it's fun it's not what probably we wanted from a she uh, but it's they good made for the, it younger didn't they but it brings it's, it's, younger well it is a kids program at the teenagers end of the day. in it's a teenager well was well, she a teen i don't know no i mm, mm, it's one of those probably hard she's about 18 in the cartoon I thought she's about 34 okay um but at the end of the day she and he-man were never designed for people of our age so what they've done with she is is fine yes you know, it fits. yeah we shouldn't really get whingy should we because no. it isn't designed for us no. now <laughs> but also, the other side is we have grown up with this and we do want it to be for us. So this feels like He-Man <laughs> and the Master Universe is being made for, for us. everybody. More <laughs> so for the, us. the older <laughs> generation who grew up with it. Um, it's for the middle-aged people now. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just so excited about that and I can't wait to, to come on and talk about it. It's mm-hmm. so good, it's so good. Okay, calm down. Okay. Bring yourself down now. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is coming out within the next month will be Nicole Bates' new comic. <laughs> My full name! <laughs> Lady Nicole Bates. Um, <laughs> we've sort of not talked about this much. I've, I've made sure you haven't given too oh, much out. I'm not be- allowed to put Because you put every bloody page up. People I know, just- I'm terrible. Yes. Yeah. Um, so do you want to just talk a little bit about this? <gasps> Am I allowed to say about it now? Because I've like pretty much... preview. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first place you can hear this. Exclusively. <laughs> Right, so so I without giving the story away. Okay, <laughs> bringing it back in now. Bringing it back. <laughs> We're just going to blur out the entire thing. So this time, I mean, I was lucky. I've been laid up for a week with my <laughs> two fir- days. <laughs> two days. That's all I needed. I I cracked on with this comic. I tell you, <laughs> it'd been trotting along. I'd got to like what twelve pages in, and then I finished all thirty six or whatever pages it is long in two days. <laughs> my brain went to mush. <laughs> But, um, now, if you know Nicole's work, she she she, she likes she likes space on the. Page. Oh, stop it! <laughs> oh, it's all you moaned about was it fell the page, Nick. It's like it's not filling the page. The the gaps, the <laughs> the the places, the the blank spaces are just as important. <laughs> but yeah, you're a bit whingy. Over Continue, that, really. Um, so I've gone back to the character, kind of the character. She's in the same colours when you get to that bit um, of the um, anxiety me character. So we're... Are we not going to give her a name? She hasn't got a name. Well, it's kind of based on me, but it's not me. So it's Nicola. (laughs) Nicola. Nicolette. (laughs) A small bit of me. Um, (laughs) Anyway, uh, she... (laughs) So, but I I took a different view because I wanted not to do the same thing as Anxiety Me. And it isn't. This is about worrying, Um, which is a completely different anxiety. It's not. Um, But they're linked. But I want to do it differently because I didn't want to do the same thing. I've just mm-hmm. repeated myself. Um, so this one, it's on black paper mainly and dark blue paper with colour at the start and the end. There's reasons for that. Um, so yes, because this, how the story goes, it takes you to a dark place. Um, I think it's, it's, I, I feel it's just as moving as anxiety me. I love doing that one. Um, but it's, I feel not cause it's on dark paper, but it feels darker, but mm-hmm. really positive outcome. Cause I can't make more people cry. I, people cried over leaf. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I was like, that's a happy story. So yeah, so this is a lot happier and I'm really pleased with a couple of the pages in it. Like really pleased mm-hmm. with them. I think they're really beautiful. So, uh, reviewers keep your eyes open. There'll be 
cop yes. is coming in a few weeks' time. Be kind, because I'm very, very fragile. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't like it, shut up. Um, I, I don't read the reviews, okay? Ian reads the reviews first and then lets me read them. <laughs> he goes, it's fine, you can look at this one. <laughs> so the plan is to hopefully have printed copies for the lakes. So if anyone's interested... Oh, what, am I just going to, like, hover around with them in my coat well, pocket and go, know we've got them, do you want a comic? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got a comic. <laughs> yeah. Four quid, comic. <laughs> Stand by people's tables. Yeah, I just nick their customers. No, I don't think that's supposed to happen. Yeah, I'm Nick Prolix. You want one of my comics? I'm just gonna like just go up to to Pete's table, and just put him on a corner. Don't tell him. Pete, we'll ask Pete. Pete probably would actually put no, him on his table. No, I never he would. Visit. Stop he it! Would. Don't put him under pressure. Pete, we're gonna talk no, to you about this. leave him alone. <laughs> but no, yeah. I mean, if you see me there, I'm sure Ian will have a few copies stashed about his they person. Will be. They will be. Um, <laughs> So, that's so that's so <laughs> cheeky. We can't do that. <laughs> we will be walking around with copies. <laughs> I'll just have a staple to we my person. We will be selling them. <laughs> We're going to bring a little foldable table. <laughs> just park oh, ourselves then, in the middle of the brewery centre. And then when Judy catches us, run, run! run. It's, it's the, the fuzz! <laughs> the pigs are in the leg. Let's go, let's go to the other centre. <laughs> They'll never know. <laughs> They'll never catch us. <laughs> a little desk by the entry. <laughs> Entryway. Yes, this way and four pound please for entry. Yeah, four pound. You get a free entry. book with it. <laughs> we will be making all the money. We'll be millionaires by Christmas. <laughs> yeah, four pound each, but you only get one book. <laughs> um, right, let's continue. <laughs> now we've been fired from working with a festival. Um <laughs> So we since last episode we've been to the volunteers meeting. We have. So that is started. So the volunteers. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the Lakes Festival, if you are based in Kendall or surrounding area, does need more volunteers. It does. Get so, your bums down there. So fun. if you're interested in... Now, let's be honest. If you want to meet these these creators, mm. it's the best way of doing it because, yes, you can queue up and have a quick signature, but you're, if you're volunteering, they'll give you the time. Yeah. They really will, and you'll, you'll, you can easily get sketches out of them for... For now. Oh, definitely. I mean, if you're volunteering, Chris got his, his whole guitar. Exactly, covered. exactly. If they yeah. can see you're helping the, the festival, they're helping comics yeah. as a whole, and they will. Yeah, spend and it's that a time. really friendly festival. So to be involved, you're not going to be you're going to be busy, but it's not going to be a stressy busy. We're going to let him secret as well. Oh, God. Volunteers on the Sunday night after mm. the festival get a little treat. They do. Waffles. You're not stripping again. Oh, waffles. Waffle party. <laughs> It's going to be a waffle party. We don't know what a waffle party. No. See, to me, when someone logistic- says waffle party, I'm just imagining, right, you just got to dress up in waffles. Wow. See, I didn't. I then just thought there would be have people there. eat them off you. Yeah, you see, this is where you're wrong. Yes. <laughs> They've got a leather party the night before, so come on. They have. How has that degenerated into a leather party? I don't know. I don't know. I don't um, have anything leathery. No, just my thong. Don't wear your thong. Though. Okay, a bit sweaty. I'm going to wear um, my cat ears. <laughs> So, but no, volunteers do get a lot of bonuses, but the main bonus is, is just being involved and being able mm. to speak to those creators directly face to face, you know. They even want people just to pick them up oh, in yeah. the car, you know. You don't even have to spend the weekend just going on the Thursday. That just could be like un, unsociable hours. <laughs> it could be. It could be. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I'll pick someone up. Yeah, that sounds great. Three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you could be trying to chat to Garth Ennis, who just wants to go to sleep and you're like, Aww. oh, tell me all about it, the boys, the boys, the boys. <laughs> Mm. Um, so <laughs> depressingly, we tried to get Garth on the show, and we've not been able to sort oh, it out due to timing time and telephone and all this. And, so frustrating. Yeah. So we're going to try and get to speak to him. Yes, definitely. He sounds legs. like a lovely guy. Right. So let's do some reviews. Go on. Now we're going to do um, Matt Garvey's new comic, First Class Hood, yep. which is intriguing. That you were talking about how you've done different types of paper, different colours, mm. and he uses different artists. To, to oh, to put different themes across. Well, different times. Yeah, different times and different moods in the book. So this is not a sequel to Red Rocket Comet, but it is... It's, it's set in the same universe, e- He calls it? it an equal. Yeah. So it's it's almost the same style. It's the same... I feel it's the same universe. It's like Does feel after like all the be. superheroes have been coming. Um, um, so it's called Glass Hood, written by Matt, art by Graham Puttock, Stefano Pavan, and the covers by Michael Ray. Um, it's, again, yeah, black and white, same highly setting detailed, present, yeah. Highly detailed work, um, following a ex criminal, well, ex super criminal, and ex superhero. superhero. Um, 
which they, they do tell you in there. And it's following the story of this criminal well, forcing the hero to dig his own grave, essentially. Yeah, basically. And then it goes into the past of why why they've got to this point. Mm. What is the reason that they're at this point as older men? Yeah. Um, one forcing the other to, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a, I think it really does look into that n- not, like the hero that never puts himself in the villain's position as to why he's done it. Whereas you're seeing it from why the villain's doing it. But then... And I, I think you emphasise with the villain, but then you understand that the hero is just doing his job. Yeah. It's it's a... Yeah, you can see both sides of this story, and I quite like that. Both sides are there. Because you've got that human element in, which is why I like it with the... Mm-hmm. Why the villain is doing it. Yeah. But the ending then puts you completely off the villain. No, I think that's really clever, and I'm so really? behind the villain. <laughs> the end. Yeah. So yeah, there's a little twist <laughs> at the end. Um, yeah, I was like, yeah. <laughs> and it's... Yeah, I mean, interesting, because I think that actually where, where you care for the villain, that knocks you off, because the villain needs to be able to see it from the hero side. Yeah, but he doesn't. And I can understand why he doesn't. Okay. So I think that's the ultimate revenge. So when you go back into the past, it's um, in colour, obviously a different style. Mm. Um, I'll keep flicking, you'll find the colour in a minute. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to point out the one <laughs> negative to this comic, and we have to, this can't, being not, and I don't know if this is purposeful or just a complete coincidence. And I apologise for bringing this up, but this... Oh, no, because now everyone will see it. Well, it kind of took me... Well, I won't say the name of the thing, right. but it kind of took me out of the comic a little bit. One of the characters yes. looks very much like a okay. rough and ready comedian, UK-based comedian. Yes. And it to the extent... That you didn't say anything and I got to that bit and I came out with exactly same the name. same name. Yeah. To the extent it took me out a little bit. Which I'm hoping it's just complete mistake. Yeah, yeah, I I know what you mean. <laughs> and Matt, t- if you want to know, yeah, just just we'll oh, it, yeah we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, yeah, it's an intriguing story mm. and certainly up Not there with Matt's art, yeah. the usual. Um, not as good as Red Rocket comic, but still a mm. good comic. Mm. And uh, very enjoyable. And again, Matt's done it again. Mm-hmm. He keeps doing it, doesn't he? We might have to nobble him. Sorry, nobble him. You know, like we do to race horses if they keep winning. <laughs> Noble can mean many things, so we'll just continue. Um, <laughs> I meant it in the the actual sense of the word. <laughs> right, let's move on. Um, I'm going to talk about one I read a little while ago. Actually, it's not been fairly recent. Uh, Cloud Hotel by Julian Hanshaw, and I've got some bump pre prepared. Hello, you with your pre prepared bump, because that's better than Noble, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, it's towards the bottom. I've got it now. Remco knows he is special. He was chosen. He reckons God took a shine to him when a bright light in a clear northern sky brought him to the incredible Cloud Hotel. It's a place of wonders, an escape from the world, and a place to be alone. Well, almost alone. But now it's time to check out, and the hotel's last two guests must race against time to find what has been lost before they overstay their welcome. <coughs> that sounds very yeah. intriguing. I haven't read this one. I'm no, you've not read this one. This is, this is, I'm going to show you the art actually while we're, mm. we're talking about it. This is, yeah, it's a little bit confusing at first. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, it's quite confusing throughout the whole lot, but confusing in, in a good way. It still makes you think and draws you in trying to work out what's going on mm-hmm. in this, this hotel. Uh, essentially, this, this little lad felt like he, he got lost and then he's, he's, he's suddenly in this hotel. Now, the question is, has he died? Oh. Is he alive? You know, it could be that this is the the gateway between life and death, mm. and you're not quite sure. That's um, kind of good though, if you're questioning it. And he meets this this girl in there who's who is just going along with it. You know, mm. isn't quite sure again what's going on, and then it progresses as the hotel starts collapsing mm. around them. You know, and you're trying to work out what's going on. The art style I really liked. Um, it's got an odd, oh, right, yes, odd look to the characters. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, but they pull you in, and you can you can the expressions come across in there. Square faces is probably the best way to say it. Um, but yeah. it's very cute, very bright, yeah, and very intriguing story. No, I like how they've done that. Really nice, isn't I it? I do like different. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the story goes through. It's got religious overtones, but nothing that jumps out in your face. Um, and it, you just follow the story, just intrigued to, to what, it, what what it all means what is it all about mm. uh, and i believe at the minute it's still only two pound 49 on comiXology for 130 40 odd page mm. graphic novel 
um, well worth picking up and having a nosy through yeah, that Yeah, definitely. Um, sort of one of those ones that just makes you think. Yeah, I'm going to read that after we come off okay. here, actually. <laughs> I do tell you about these I things. I know, but you see, it's like your iPad. and, it's and not, I it's feel that like, iPad. It's, well, only because I put that picture of the Witcher in the bathtub at the front. <sighs> um, but, yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 yeah, I need to look in it. I do enjoy comics all. Just, it gives you that opportunity to try new things without having to spend so much money, mm. you know. £15, pounds, taking a risk if you've not heard of a graphic yeah, novel, yeah. but £2.50, you know. It's worth yeah. worth trying. Um, and finally, um, Tom's going to talk about Tony Esmond's yes. The Hawk Chronicles. But Dirty boy. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the detail because I'm sure Tom will do that. Um, I just wanted to ask your opinion. He's a dirty boy. <laughs> of the stuff. <laughs> I'm not going to have words with him when I see him. Um, well, again, I'll, I'm not going to go and explain what it's all about. Cause I think Tom it says. <laughs> the title says it's all, I think you'll find. <laughs> There's two parts to this this comic. There's yes. the the written segments. Yes, which are really disturbing. And then the segments where they're talking to prostitutes. Well, they're interviewing prostitutes, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. They're very short and sweet, but they really get a message across on each one, I felt. It brings the... Because it's not crass the interview parts no. it brings the almost not the hopelessness but the this is this is my life type thing this is what i've got mm-hmm. to do it, it brings that kind of there's no no you know oh what's the word <laughs> it doesn't hold its punches it, it you know it mm-hmm. does it in a very short space of time it puts because i mean these women they don't really want to be doing it. they don't like they said in one of them they don't choose this life um yeah, it's it's interesting, and I, I, you do you. I feel sorry because to find yourself in that situation, but they're tough birds, and that comes. But across. they're not when they start. No, and that's the thing. We, yeah, we know that, they don't become we? tough birds, don't they? There's one a bit about love mm-hmm. that really got me. Which you know the one I'm talking mm-hmm. about. Um, that was yeah, yeah, shocking and sad. And, and it was everything. sad, wasn't it? Because he just left the money. Have I spelled that one? <laughs> <laughs> I've spelled that one. Right, maybe this. cut that one out. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll leave because oh. unless you read, you won't know. Um, I hope that's that intriguing was... <laughs> enough because if you want to go and grab it, it's pound fifty for the digital copy. Mm. It's not much to go and read. No. It's got physical as well. But it's it's intriguing. Yeah, the story part, I found that really disturbing, the first bit of that one. Yeah, the, the problem. Why the... didn't they link? Because I'm pretty certain the Peggy mm-hmm. from the first one that you have in the background is the Peggy from the second the one. The best bits are the comics. Yeah. They really are. And, mm. and uh, it, it's, it's again, this oh, education, no. which is something we talked to um, Kate about, educational use of comics. Yes. Um, whether oh, it's gosh, done yeah, it's that as well. in a heavy way like this or in a lighter way. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. The medium is wonderful, mm. and it's it's all its, its forms. It is amazing, isn't it? I really do. I mean, we talked a bit like with Kate about this, didn't we? The fact that you wouldn't pick up a book that was just full of not oh, some of these subjects. You wouldn't sit there and read a full book. About no, some it. people would, but not the everyday person would. No, but I mean, you get so much information across in a comic, and mm. I think we as a society need to realise that comic is a valid way of education. It's a fantastic way of getting information across. We are visual learners. It's it's. Yeah, Britain it doesn't to... see that, do you? Well, it needs smacking over the head with a comic. <laughs> <laughs> Any particular does. one. Watchmen, just... that's quite thick. That'll <laughs> I was be... just trying to think of a thick one. <laughs> one of the Walking Dead compendiums. That'll kill somebody. <laughs> Excellent. Right, so... We're going to leave you, gal. That's it. We're done for the day. Oh, because of because of certain people. <laughs> so, so we've got Tom coming on in a moment to continue the talk on the Hawk Chronicles. Yes. Um, then we talked to Kate Charlesworth mm-hmm. about her, her life and times and her book. She was really, She's really lovely, lovely to talk lovely to. Lovely lady. And then we'll leave the rest for Mike and Pete to uh, ramble well, on. Carry on till tomorrow. I think they <laughs> talk for it. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. Um, next episode, we'll have more reviews of the usual also a look at tom of finland's oh we're yeah, going to that aren't that's we soon up because the lakes is almost here i know right Squee. <laughs> enjoy <laughs>
Hello everyone and welcome to Small Press, the small press review section of the Comic Art Festival podcast with Tom from That Comic Smell podcast. How is everyone this fine, fine day? Now here to talk about a very special book that was passed on to me very recently and has a lot of collaborators involved with one writer. It's a really interesting comic on a whole, really interesting subject matter as well. I am of course talking about The Horror Chronicles, created by Tony Esmond of the Awesome Comics Podcast, and with many a very, very, very talented artist involved. Now, straight off the bat, it has a really interesting front cover that I believe was done by Vince Hunt from the Awesome Comics Podcast, and it's like a VHS tape, so it's on its side. I actually really can't wait to see this comic in physical form. I've only read it digitally so far um, and I think it's going to look like a nice little piece physically, especially with the presentation of the front cover, which is a slight downside in digital but you can still turn your phone or turn your tablet to see it but it's got on there like the little sticker saying the Whore Chronicles and who the interviews are done by. Obviously Tony's name is first but all the artists that are on it are after it. Each story tends to have a name except from the prose pieces that are on the inside. There's two prose pieces in between the comics and it actually kind of breaks it up quite nicely. I think when it's such a heavy topic the way that it is, even though the prose pieces are still quite heavy, I think it does well to have something in between that kind of breaks it up a wee bit. So we have names like Shelley, Peggy... Diane, and uh, the first pro story being the story of Sydney Small. I'm not going to say all of them off the bat because I'm, I'm going to say right now I think everybody should definitely be checking this out. Oh yeah, the covers by Vince Hunt. Every time it's a new story, it's interview conducted by, and then it's got Tony's name and the artist after it. He has picked the absolute cream of the crop to work with him on this, I would say, because each artist that works with the story fits it perfectly, absolutely perfectly. There's, I, I can't imagine anybody else doing the stories that they've done. So you've got likes of Rachel Ball, Sarah Harris, Rick Jackson, Tom Curry, Charles H. Raymond. There's also pinups in the back by Stuart Mulrane and Vince Hunt. It all starts with an absolutely brilliant piece by Rachel Ball. Some of the colours that's in this are just utterly fantastic. Do you know, there's a lot of humour flowing through this comic. Just as I'm, I'm going through this just now in front of me. There's a lot of humour goes through this comic, but it's funny how it comes across really well that the humour is masking the dark aspect of it. It's an interviewer that you don't see, and the girl in front of them either in a chair or on a couch or something like that, and they're staring back at what seems to be like a camera, and they're giving their name and saying a little story about themselves and what, what they do. It is about sex workers... And stories about what they've encountered. There are some absolutely beautiful stories in this. I know it's it can be crude and it might not be for everybody because some people might not be able to stomach the stories that are told. I personally don't think they're too lewd or crude or anything. I don't think you could have an accurate sex worker story and not have some very frank and honest tales to be told in amongst it. So Tony does a really good job of getting them across without completely grossing you out and putting you off. It's really very expertly told a lot of the stories within it. There is one in particular though that absolutely kills me. Not just because of the story itself, but because of the way the artwork is drawn. It just fits perfectly. All of them fit perfectly. I cannot stress that enough. They all fit perfectly, but this one is just unbelievable. There's so many different sort of medium aspects going on between it. There is paint and there's a lot of nice colour work, but there's almost like materials going through it, like bits of cotton and stuff. The, the story's called Peggy, but the, the top is Peggy's Fate. And the art is by Sarah Harris. And it's about a woman who's out at a bar and meets a man. And they hit it off and they have a good night and they go back to her place. And he leaves her a note on a table saying that he's had a great night. And that he wants to call her again and he wants to see her again. But as he's shutting the door, it's like these wisps of cotton that show the wind blow the note off the table and under the bed. And he's written at the bottom that 
he wants her to get a cab home with some money, but the only thing that's left on the table is the money. She sees the money and says, oh, he knew, and starts crying. That just absolutely killed me. The story was great. The way it's laid out is absolutely beautiful. There are some really interesting composition ideas going on in this page and some of the panels are just unreal. The characters are drawn beautifully. The colours are just fantastic. Some of the words are are done in such a way that it's it's going to be really interesting when you have the physical book and you have to turn the book and everything to read it. It's just it's fantastic. It gives you a really interactive feel with the comic. The comic shouldn't just be stories on a page and that's it there was never explicitly told that comics should just be stories on the page and just batter through a bit of interactive play within a book is always fun and this is this is definitely a good way of, of absorbing the story and getting the story across to you in a in a totally unique way but it's just such a killer and it, it, it just destroyed me at the end of it I felt so distraught not just for her but for him as well because he's going away thinking that he's going to see her again and he's not and she is just thinking that he knew her, her secret and she's destroyed for it it's just oh absolutely gutting and then because that's so hard hitting there's then the the pro story just after it which is it's just fantastic a nice little split up but you really need to see some of the art that's in this and and the color choices and everything really equate to the story as well i mean Rick Jackson's one's a wee bit more kind of rough and ready and the colours are all, it's almost like it's on like a black and white camera. Whereas Charles H. Raymond's one, the story is pretty out there, I'll just say that, it's pretty out there, but there is an element of humour about it and his sort of more cartoony style and clean lines and everything and and more sort of brighter colours and that really equate to get the feel of, of it of the whole story over and his is broken down in just sort of four panels each page kind of thing as well it's it's yeah utterly fantastic i really thoroughly enjoyed this and you know it's a, a 35 pages tony says it's on his website where you can find find a link to his description of it and where to find it and um, he marks it down as a 35 pages color and black and white comic you can go and see that for yourself. Nip across to neveronironanything.blogspot.com and I think it should still be the first post just now. But you'll see it. You'll see it straight away. It, it, that big striking image of the VHS as the front cover is is right there. But the great thing about it in the back as well is that there's an advertisement for Beyond the Streets. And it's Beyond the Streets is a UK-based charity who sees the possibility of life beyond sexual exploitation. Find them at beyondthestreets.org.uk or call them for help and advice on 0300 3021 122. I was really glad to see that Tony is promoting at the end for everybody to head across there and help them out. He actually says if you get a chance, head over and drop them some money if you've you've got some spare money. And if you have any cash left, head over to neverironanything.bigcartel.com and buy the book. So he's promoting beyondthestreets.org.uk over the fact that he's got this comic out and to be putting out a great book with a good message a good solid message and to do it bluntly and honestly and to work with great creators is is fantastic and he's doing it at a brilliant price digital copy 150 physical copy 350 but i thoroughly recommend it cannot wait to see it in physical copy the only thing i would want to see is is to maybe spend more time with with the characters but their stories are such that you, you're kind of you, it's the only kind of time that you can spend with them that's relevant to the comic kind of thing. But he's done such a good job of weaving these characters that it would be nice to spend a wee bit more time with them. So I really do hope that he does another instalment of it. I'm sure there is plenty more stories that he's he's got lined up. But yeah, head on over to neverironanything.blogspot.com and get an introduction to The Whore Chronicles. And if you feel like picking it up, then head across to neverironanything.bigcartel.com. You'll be able to find it there. Like I say, digital copy, £1.50, physical copy, £3.50. And most definitely head across to beyondthestreets.org.uk and give them a wee helping hand if you can. You can find Tony... On Twitter as Professor Riptide at E Z O H Y E Z at S O S. And you can also find them on the Awesome Comics Podcast every Monday 
so make sure and subscribe to them. You can find him and the rest of the Awesome Pod team across at the Awesome Pod. And that is it for Small Pressed this time. If, like Tony, you've got a great comic or you're working on something and you'd like people to hear about it and you'd like people to read it, then send it my way. Send it to thatcomicsmell at gmail.com or you can also contact me through Twitter at U-R-A-M-Y-X, Uramix, or at my own podcast Twitter, at That Comic Smell. Just let me know any recommendations that you have, or if you're working on something, or some of your friends are working on something. I'd love to hear about some of the projects that are up and coming with folks, definitely, and I'm sure everybody else would like to hear them as well. I'd love a chance to review some of them as well. I hope you all have a great couple of weeks, and I will see you next time. Bye for now. Thank you for coming on. That's fine. Thank um, you for asking me. No, looking forward to it. So we've really enjoyed the book. Mm. It's uh, taught us a lot, I think, is the way to to discuss it. Yeah, um, well, that's part, 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 of, part, of the, part of the idea of it, you know. Yeah. Well, we'll <laughs> get to... I, I believe you didn't like the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> You're not meant to listen to a review. Oh, ah, well. <laughs> they're, they're actually classic Doc Mac. Classic Doc Martens of the period. Can, can I be honest? I'm, I I don't like Doc Martens, but that's just my personal taste. And yes, you've well. you've abused me about this before. I Nikki, have, as well. yes, all the time. <laughs> that's just me. I'm a, I'm a raver. We don't wear Doc Martens. A raver. <laughs> yeah, not even monkey boots. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to go straight from there because that that's going to stay in the podcast. Me being abused about boots. Um, yes, <laughs> We have uh, Kate Charlesworth with her, uh, author of Sensible Footwear, A Girl's Guide. Thank you very much again for coming on. My pleasure. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about the book shortly, but first we want to roll back time, back to your early days. Uh, were you into comics back then? Um, I was actually. I mean, apart from when I was a little kid and I took the Beano and the Bunty, you know, that kind of thing. Um, when I was a teenager, I got into DC comics. Okay. And uh, I, I was never Marvel, you know, I, I mm-hmm. kind of st- stuck with DC. There were so many different titles, it was uh, hard to keep up, really. But um, I loved them, and um, and I thought, you know, Kurt Swan, who used to draw Superman, I thought, oh, I could never draw as well as that. <laughs> <laughs> so I set the bar quite high for myself. So where, uh, where were you getting them from? Because we always struggled growing up ourselves, mm. getting sort of American comics. So whereabouts... Um, well, this would, this would have been the mid sixties, I suppose. And the, the, the local news agent kept them. And, but also there was a, uh, there's a stall on the local market, which was fantastic because you got annuals, you know, and mm-hmm. I've got some wonderful comics there. And of course, got rid of all as you do. Yeah. Uh, you know, Green Lantern, Justice League, all of them, pretty much all of them. And Superman. That's good to hear. Super that. Dog. Well. I know, Super, <laughs> yeah. Super Dog didn't actually have his own comic, but you know, I bet, I bet at one point he did. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> they'll milk as much money as they can. <laughs> um, that's interesting. That yeah, as I say, we we've been from the six. I mean, we, what, we grew up in the eighties, and yeah. really struggled to certainly where we're from, struggle to find them anyway. Mm. So that's intriguing, is that? Mm. So you're quite I, lucky, by the sounds of it. I was lucky actually. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty pretty good. Um, so how did you get into illustration then? What what made you decide to go down that route? Um, well, I went to art college, mm-hmm. um, and wh- when I actually went to art college, I fancied doing theatre design, actually, because I, I was kind of, I was backstage struck, mm-hmm. um, and I did actually go on a theatre course for a while, but I realised that I wasn't, at the time, a team player, so <laughs> working, you, you know, the, some of the actors were really cranking up themselves, and, and the best actors were invariably the nicest people, so... Um, I didn't really complete that course, and I, and I thought, you know, I, I realised that the world of theatre wasn't for me, you know, as a, as a designer. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, quite, I like drawing the pictures, I like designing the sets, but, um, you know, that was the end of it. So when I'd been at art college, I'd mostly done graphics. So I, eventually I thought, well, I suppose, this was in Manchester, and I thought, I suppose I'd better put a portfolio together and, go down to London and try and earn a living. Mm-hmm. I fell back on illustrations. Um, so I started out as an illustrator. 
and I got an agent in London. Photorealism was the thing at the time, so I put this photorealistic portfolio together. Mm. And unfortunately, by the time I finished with it, I was bored witless. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of these drawings, which were lovely, took about a week to do. They were very immaculate. Mm. And uh, and cartoons are a bit quicker than that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and also they kept me amused. So so what happened was basically I, I kind of, as an illustrator, the, the, the photorealism gradually changed to humorous illustration. And the humorous illustration gradually turned to cartoons. Mm. I was doing, um, I was illustrating, I was doing work for a magazine called World Medicine. And one day they said, oh, Kate, would you, would you be interested in doing cartoons for our letters page? And I said, um, what with um, the speech bubbles? And they said, yeah, yeah. And I thought, yes, that's it. Crack it. <laughs> cartoons, proper cartoons. Because I had to fancy being a cartoonist when I was a kid. Okay. So I was a you know, working illustrator. But all the time I've been doing that, the day job, I'd been doing um, cartoons for Dyke magazine, for a Dyke magazine, and then later on for Gay News mm-hmm. and Feminist magazine. So I had this, I had the alternative stuff as alongside uh, the day job, um, and it was, you know, cross board. It's cartoons and illustration eventually, but um, in in the eighties, around about the time of the AIDS crisis, um, I was asked to. Um, contribute to a graphic compilation album called Strip Aids, which was put together by a guy called Don Melia, who was um, himself as a, a gay comics artist. He had a superhero called Matt Black, which is such a good name. <laughs> and, and they invited comics people, comics creators, mm-hmm. and cartoonists. And that, for me, that was the kind of crossover point where you know, two worlds met, and and at that, um, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I met the knockabout lot. Mm. Yes. <laughs> and I met, I met Woodrow Phoenix or Trev's Phoenix, as he was at the time, and and eventually I met Brian Talbot, and and just, mm-hmm. you know, lots and lots of comics folk. So after that, I gradually contributed to anthologies and albums and comics, and uh, and that picks up eventually so yeah work you did a bit of work with the talbots as well i believe is that right for the sally heathcote yeah suffragette that was, i must have not read that first no. just just, in, just investigating just. <laughs> intriguing well, um yeah we did that in um i was just about to start i was starting in on this book this sensible footwear mm-hmm. thing which i've been working on in my head anyway for quite a long time and mucking about with scripts and brian i met brian and he said oh he said um Mary's just written another script because they'd done Daughter of a Father's Eyes, so they were doing it at the time. And he said it's about suffragettes. And I'm busy doing Granville, my Granville series. Um, would you be interested in doing the illustration, you know, drawing it? <laughs> would I? <laughs> just a bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, you know. And so I did. So Mary wrote it. Brian designed it very closely mm-hmm. and, you know, did all the, obviously, the text um, typo and all the rest of it, and I did the illust- I did the illustration leg, so it was like a huge, huge illustration job. Mm. And uh, I mean, Brian described it as Mary was the writer, he was the um, director, and I was the performer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, you know, That's in nice. comics, you know, the sort of seniority is reversed, so you know, <laughs> the, 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 you know, the writer is is king or queen, and yeah. so on. So that was fantastic. It's a really, really good book because it's a cracking story. Considering you've just done your own graphic novel, um, how did you find working under someone else's script? Well, um, everybody asked me that, and um, when I first when I first got the script, and not just the script, that's fine. Um, I we did it all by email, so um, Brian would send a load of page roughs. Um, well, in layers, you know, with a, um, a design and the text and the grid. Mm-hmm. And at first I thought, oh, well, I don't know, you know, if I got to follow all this, his drawings then, <laughs> uh, I thought, well, maybe I could change this a bit. But within about half an hour, I thought, this is madness. These, are, You know, this man is a master of his trade, of his craft, <laughs> you know. 
why, you know, so um, that was great. And I also realized I've just saved six months' work because I didn't have to do any of the design, which takes a hell of a long time. And, uh, and it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book. We're, we're all nitpickers, so we're all, we're all very keen to make it look as good and as accurate mm -hmm. uh, as we could. Um, yeah, so what year was that, roughly? Um, came out in 2014. And then you were saying you were still you were already on with sensible footwear at that point. Yeah, yeah. I I'd started making kind of rough notes for it. In well, I've got I've got some documents that say 2007. So obviously I was doing it then. But I've been thinking about it for about well since the turn of the century. That sounds really a long time. Turn of the century. <laughs> I had this idea because I thought, you know, people will forget their history mm -hmm. already. You know, in, in the, the late nineties, it was everything was so different to how it was. And this, you know, this is before gay marriage came in, but it was yeah. obvious, you know, on the cards. And I thought, uh, you know, it should be in one. Everything should be collected into one space and not in text because that would be, you know, who the hell would want to read it? <laughs> um, but so in, in a graphic novel then. Perhaps I could be the person to do it on a graphic compilation. So I had this great idea that I had everything, you know, LGBT, um, everybody in great detail. And I thought, that's wrong because that, that's just crazy. <laughs> you know, I've been dead before I'd, you know, finished the first 20 years. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll make it into, I'll, I'll do it from the mid, mid century, 1950. I was born then, mm -hmm. and and use that a sort of thread of personal memoir to sort of tie all the history together, mm. and uh, which is a good idea. But I, I'd not really intended it to be such um, so much so much of a memoir, you know. And when I took it to Myriad, um, Corinne Perlman sent it out to readers, you know, and I sent it, I had about half the script together by then. And I suppose this would have been about, oh, I don't know, 2013 maybe. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, it's really interesting. <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> by faint praise. And they said, you know, we want more personal stuff. You know, that bit where your dad was dying, that was really good. More of that. Oh, God. <laughs> And I said, well, there's going to be jokes in it, you know. And she said, well, not too many. And I said, I'm a cartoonist. There has to be jokes. I have a cartoon life. So it became um, very much a, um, a memoir, you know, mm -hmm. and, and social history. And, and they were absolutely right because, I mean, I would never want to read a 320 – page solid lgbt um history however however pretty it looked <laughs> <laughs> it does i mean we've discussed about books so many times about mm. how educational graphic novels can be certainly yes. for not just for adults but for kids in particular you know they're, they're more likely going to read something like this mm. um and learn about the history rather than like you say yeah. a standard novel yeah. so it's it's superb for that how was it going back to those times and how did it feel as you, you were going through your journey again? <laughs> um, it was, it was strange really. Cause I mean, I mean, I've not forgotten any of the journey, but what had happened was that by accident, um, myself and some other people, especially David Shenton, a gay cartoonist, it was this kind of era, which is about when I started, um, uh, drawing alternative, you know, queer cartoons, if you like, of the gay press. And there are, there are an awful lot of magazines, mostly for blokes, but there was a lot there was a lot out there. And it's in a pre social media age, pre computer. So the only the only way people could um, really keep in touch with each other or get information out was in hard copy press print. And we were just doing cartoons um, as things happened, you know, you know, making daft jokes but you know, looking at the zeitgeist, if you like, what was happening. And so looking back, um, we all discovered that we'd accidentally documented LGBT history in comic form, in cartoons. So I had all that to um, look at. And then, of course, personally, you know, memory and um, lots of photographs, 
an, an, an awful lot of um, stuff to draw on. I've got a horrible, I've got a crap memory for names of faces. But I'm, <laughs> I'm quite good visually, so that really helped. Um, scattered throughout the book as well as how you go into actual historic information um, as, as you're going through the book. Uh, one of the things that jumps out, I think we loved, is the changes in style mm. when you see those pages. Was that something you planned from the start, or how did you go about designing those? It was. I mean, from the, from the start, I, I planned that there would be different styles because there was just so much in it. Yeah. You know, but uh, things had to be parceled out, if you like, just just to make it uh, comprehensible. Mm. And and also, it, it cheered me up doing different things as well. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, the history thing. Uh, part of the history dovetails with the memoir at certain points yes. but the actual history um I, I thought a lot about how to do it you know um a timeline i thought oh christ you know that's going to be look very dreary you know just a, lot, a list of facts and if i had a timeline say um running at, at the bottom of every page that would be very restrictive graphically mm. and so i thought well what I could do is do clumps of years um, and, and collage them, um, mostly on double-page spreads. And so if I did that, that would allow me to do quite big images if I wanted to and just drop things in. And it would mean that instead of just your eye just runs, no, cross the dates, cross the dates, cross the dates, you've got to kind of look into the pages and pick bits out and you can linger on drawings or uh, I think it's more interesting. Mm. I thought it was more interesting. No, I think it's something as well, once you've read the book, it's something you can go back to. Oh, definitely. You can yeah. sort of flick through it and just pick out these pages, which mm. is quite fun as well. Mm. Um, yeah, lots of things hidden in there. <laughs> While you were, I'm, I'm assuming you had to do quite a bit of research for these, did. these pages. Yep. Is there anything that surprised you? Um, well, I did know quite a lot of it, and I, I'm, I'm struggling to sort of pluck something out of the air that I, I didn't actually know. I mean, there were lots of little nuggets of things that were new to me because they, nobody can know everything. Mm-hmm. I think the thing that surprised me most, really, was when I was actually coming towards the end of the book or, or even starting the pages. It really, And it shocked me. It was that um, how since I'd first started to think about doing a book like this, I thought, well, you know, this is going to be, this could be, I thought it was going to be important just some, you know, so that we don't forget our history because it's easily done. Um, and young, yeah, especially younger people now won't know what, what it was like back mm-hmm. then. And that's important. But the thing that really shocked me was how instead of being an interesting and important thing to do, it's become a necessity because, you know, the world is, lurching towards the right you know this is when books start to be burned mm. um, and that was really frightening and the shock and so i'd always thought that we should never be complacent because you know oh, you yeah, know it's great you know you've got equal marriage now and this that and the other but um and these are very very hard fought for human rights mm. But you know they could they could go get the wrong regime in and and you're off. I mean, look what's happening, yeah. Boris. Jeez, <laughs> let's not go <laughs> let's there. Not go there. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Please, I didn't have to. Mm. But yeah, so so although things have changed fantastically, you can never be complacent. No. You know, um, anti-gay, anti-LGBT um, violence is on the rise. Unfortunately, there's always going to be idiots out there. That's uh, that's what it comes down to. But the idiots are being given permission to yeah. do yeah. that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's Gurr. Gurr, indeed. <laughs> it's annoying. <laughs> it's yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't want to go into that. It's it just it's so frustrating looking at the news every single day. And oh. it's, oh. anyway, let's let's move away from today. Um, <laughs> something I think that growing up, obviously, our attitudes with gay lesbian and so forth we grew up where it was, it was just normal it wasn't an issue certainly in our families mm-hmm. we've never been a, never been a problem but there's certainly been a lot of history on gay issues and and, and how they but not much about lesbians so it was interesting as well to have a book that focused more on the female side mm. yeah um, have you found anybody coming out and talking about that and found it's helped them in any ways 
Um, yes, I think I think people are really pleased to to see us as there, yeah. you know, because um, be, because lesbianism or dykery or you know however you want to describe mm-hmm. it was was never actually illegal, um, although there was an attempt at the beginning of the last century by some MP to try and make it so. I think people were I think the MPs were the apologies were just embarrassed and just go yeah. Shut up, shut up. <laughs> uh, so it never really got anywhere. But um, th- there used to be this old joke or this, this old rumour, it wasn't true, that um, they, politicians wanted to include women in the, I think it was, it was a Labourshire Amendment, I can't remember, uh, which, which um, p- gave, you know, male homosexuals, draconian sentences on male homosexuality and they apparently wanted to include women in that but nobody had the bottle to tell Queen Victoria so they didn't do it <laughs> <laughs> which is a great story but it's not true oh. so what, what happened was that we just we, we, women probably because we thought not to be important men were the great threat you know uh, but because um, and so in consequence we didn't suffer the horrible horrible things that so many men did suffer mm. awful Awful blackmail. It was a black. It was a blackmailer's charter, but because of that, it rendered us even more invisible. Yeah. Um, as women often are too. You know, women judge research. I was trying to look up um, an ancestor of mine, and she got married and she disappeared. You know, because she took on somebody else's name. Yeah. So women have always had a. Um, areas of invisibility and, and we've had them in spades as it were mm. yeah no it's 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 sad but you, as you said you certainly see things have improved for yeah. yourself and the culture which is which is absolutely brilliant um so you're up at the lakes this year i am you are um one of yep. the things i it's think fabulous. <laughs> yeah well one of the things obviously this year they've got uh quite a few areas looking at lgbt mm. culture um tom of finland exhibition which is looking yeah. really really good um and you've got a panel as well haven't you yeah um can you talk a bit um, about the idea behind that or, or what you're going to be talking about well um i'm on a panel with um or a conversation i suppose with um brian talbot chairing it and Myself and Daryl um, Daryl Cunningham, who's mm-hmm. another um, myriad artist, yep. and really, I, I mean, we have such wildly different styles. I mean, I mean, Daryl's is so pared down, mm-hmm. and I, I mean, beautiful. I mean, it's so lucid, but I, I mine, there's all sorts going on, you know. And so we're we're going to be, I suppose, talking about how different in our different ways. We put we we present information, mm. um, so I think that'll be an interesting talk because you, you know it'll cover drawing styles and mm. our thought processes and and how we work, and um, and and Brian will be uh, the puppet master in the middle in between, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps. And the other events uh, uh, and events um, on uh, censorship. And comics, yeah, yeah. And uh, Tony Bennett from Knockabouts, one of the people on the panel, who was famously involved um, in was it the ages when customs and excise were, you know, you know, anybody would think they were trying to close them down <laughs> um, because um, you know they were shipping crumbs comics over from America, and it wasn't it wasn't the drugs and and Gilbert Shelton's. And, you know, it wasn't the drugs they were objecting to. It was bits of sex uh, and not much actual sex of it at that. Um, mm-hmm. And they went through terrible legal hoops and uh, and and they they won in the end. But, you know, it, um, it ground them down dreadfully. Mm-hmm. It was terrible financial loss. So we'll be talking about censorship. Did you um, have any issues in regards to censorship with your earlier work at all or...? Was it with it with being focused on the gay press? Was it never an issue? Um, not really. No. Um, was it? Was it? Well, um, in the gay, in the gay press, it was. Um, I, I used to do this series in, in gay news. It was a it was a daft thing. It was a kind of take on 
I don't know if you remember Brooke Bond's tea cards, you know, like yes. trading cards. So you'd have a picture of a bird on the front and it would be the information about the bird on the back. And I had a thing called exotic species, some of our British gays, you know. So <laughs> 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 there were all these drawings of different sorts of blokes like, or, or women, you know, men. men and, and it was like, oh, you'd have, um, um, I got one, there's two male cyclists and they've got, they, they're in, it was a night time and they were taking the kit off. And they got their bikes propped up and they said, and the bike lights were on. And one of them said, oh, shall we do the lights on? You know, <laughs> shall we leave the lights on? Ha ha. And what very different style. It was a long time ago. And some daft copy on the back. And it, and it was, there were about 50 of these things uh, published. It was Gay News as Fortnightly. And, it, and I worked with them for about two or three years. Mm-hmm. And they were published by Gay Men's Press in a, in a small book. Um, I mean, there were stereot- there were stereotypes. It was a send- sending us all up, myself included, and uh, and the publishers got this really fierce, let- angry letter from um, a woman called Pat Arrowsmith, who is still around and is a very, very famous peace campaigner. And she was wildly angry that. Um, that this awful book might be seen by straight people, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and what a terrible impression that would give of gay people. Um, you know, they only printed 800 copies, so, you know, the likelihood was, was slender that anybody would see it, even the gay community. So, so there's that kind of thing. And also, and funnily enough, earlier on when I did work for a magazine called Sappho, you know, they say, draw what you know. And the only thing I knew about were, we're rifty tufty old bar dykes. <laughs> this strip about this dreadful woman who was a right womanizer, basically, in, in a humorous way. But I was quite young and I didn't realize that um, people were furious about it. You know, oh, this isn't the image of lesbians we want to promote. It's like they didn't want to frighten the horses. And I was drawing these really um, rather common. Women <laughs> were having, having a life, you know. Um, so really, it was a, only that, only that sort of thing. So I never really did. I was lucky. I, know, I can't remember anything of my stuff that I know. I, I know was censored. Good, good. <laughs> um, so you're going to be signing books, obviously at the lakes as well. I'm assuming. Mm. Yeah. So oh, yes. if you're coming along, if you've not. Uh, but sensible footwear, a girl's guide. Have a look at it. Oh, definitely. Grab the book, and yes. it's well worth reading. Get a signature while you're there, mm-hmm. and a cheeky little drawer, and she'll give you one. Um, <laughs> she might. <laughs> she might. If you're buying a book. <laughs> Actually, last question before we let you go. Um, yeah. The title. Yeah. Where did your idea for that come from? Well, um, it was all that was always the working title because. Um, it, um, Sensible footwear. It was always a bit of a. It was a a uh, covert way of saying, "I think she's a lesbian." That people might say, mm, "I think she wears rather sensible shoes." You know, <laughs> of somebody who looked like they might be a dyke, or, or they were. And in America, it's. Uh, I think, yeah, she's a sort of girl who wears comfortable footwear. <laughs> so, so that's what it means. It, it means it means you're a lesbian lesbians were, but but and that's how it was great it was it used to be a, practically a foolproof method of you know telling if somebody was a dyke or not you looked at their shoes and bingo and then it all changed and there were lipstick lesbians and you couldn't tell anymore so <laughs> how dare they <laughs> and now it's all oh it's Every woman for herself. <laughs> <laughs> department. So if you're not uh, coming to the lakes, however, search for Sensible Footwear Girls Guide. Now Thank we know you. where the title came from. Um, yeah, no, as I keep saying, it is well worth reading. It's another mm. wonderful myriad book. They need to keep, they keep getting them, keep grabbing you amazing authors and throwing them out there because mm. there's so much educational content yes. in there. And I mean, it's brilliant. Jokes. There's yes. jokes. Yes. And jokes. Oh, yeah, I say educational sounds boring, doesn't it? But <laughs> Trust me, if it's boring, I won't read it. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your time, Kate. Thank and you very we'll, much for having me. Uh, see you in October. Will. See you then. Room for one lawgiver, please. Ah, Judge Dredd. Or is it just Dredd? Fancy seeing you here. Catwoman, 
You also here for the Comic Art Festival or a stint in the ISO cubes? Of course. I love to see my makers in action. Ah! Watch it, Greeny! Careful, Hulk. In this town we have a saying. Once is a coincidence, twice is a booking offence. <laughs> I think he booked the events on the website. Huh? Comicartfestival.com It's got all the perfect information about the event. Yeah, so's my fist. Druck, I'm out of here. Not standing around with those four tortoises that have just entered the building. Cowbunga, dude! Find out all about the Lakes International Comic Art Festival and booking information at www.comicartfestival.com How do? Welcome to Mutter Downs, the yakking about comics section of the podcast. I'm Pete Taylor. I'm an illustrator and comics creator. Online, I trade as this man, this Pete. And my co-host is... Mike Williams. Uh, I'm generally just a big comic fanboy. Uh, I've been recording for this podcast since day one, which is <laughs> now over two years old. Um, and I do a section normally called Mike's Mutterings. Yes. So this has become sort of a, an, an annual event for us and sometimes any any time there's a special occasion so uh we've done different subjects in the past haven't we we've done marvel versus dc and um what was the last one we did swords versus sorcery swords and sorcery yeah. of course and now uh we're going to we're gonna, it's not a versus anymore is it we're just going to essentially have a look through the festival program and there's some events that have just sort of um, popped into mind as being good starting points for a, a bit of a yak, aren't there? So absolutely, yeah. First of uh, a two-parter. Uh, our fans will be pleased to hear. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll be doing uh, five today, discussing uh, five events from the festival today, and then in the next episode we'll be discussing five more. So we're going to start, aren't we, discussing gothic top, comics. Top gothic comic for us both. Um, the inspiration from this came from on the first day of the festival, on the Friday, um, between 10 and 5, they're holding a comics up close masterclass. Um, and this is, they've done this in previous years, I think. It's, it's kind of a a more academic side of comics where they have keynote presentations, panel discussions and uh, discuss papers that have been published. And one of those papers is from Catherine Spooner. Um, My friend, the devil Gothic comics. And this is from Catherine Spooner, uh, professor Catherine Spooner and her particular research interests incorporate Gothic literature, film, comics, popular culture, fashion and costume in literature and film. And her most recent book is post-millennial Gothic comedy, Romance and the Rise of Happy Gothic. So we thought, OK, <laughs> this one jumped out <laughs> us because we both like the Gothic uh, aesthetic. Um, yeah. And the idea was uh, just to come up with our top Gothic comic. So uh, do you want to go first on this one? Gothic comics to me instantly bring to mind Gene Colan. Mostly known as a Silver Age comic artist, worked on Daredevil and Wonder Woman. Uh, extensive history with Marvel. Worked with them in the 50s on some of their monster comics, I think. Uh, incredibly fluid, smoky visuals. He did very full pencils. So the reproduction of his work was largely really down to who was inking him. Some inkers like Tom Palmer could work wonders with his pages. And then, you know, other artists that were, you, you know, perhaps a little more graphic, perhaps found it more difficult to ink him. Um, but the work other than Daredevil that I think he's, he's, he's mainly known for is the gothic comic that uh, I decided to talk about. And that is Tomb of Dracula which is the 1972 uh, comic. Now, this was when um, Marvel had uh, been under the auspices of the Comics Code for many years. 
right. which happened yes. to be after the sort of Senate hearings in the 50s. The comics companies put their own sort of guidelines in place, largely, it seems, to get rid of the very successful publishing company, EC Comics. So you couldn't do any supernatural comics. Um, you couldn't feature werewolves. You couldn't feature vampires. Um you know the villains couldn't be seen to be um getting any rewards from their crimes but well, by... Tales from the crypt was a big yes. reason behind the ban wasn't it so it was a lot of that kind of genre yeah. the visuals that were shown in the senate hearing were pretty much exclusively i think from ec comics so you had lots of decapitated heads um and you had some you know violent imagery from something like crime does not pay but by the time we get to 72, um, I mean, Marvel's been going for, what, roughly about 10 years in its, you know, successful post-Fantastic Four era. So by the time we got to 1972, um, the Comics Code had started to, you know, lose some of its teeth. And they were willing, I think, for, for some other areas to explore. I think as well, we're now in the 70s period where Marvel is desperate to expand. So this is the era where they they start exploring things like you know uh, black exploitation and kung fu and yeah. horror is one of the areas that they move into. Um, it's I think also relevant that they start with something like Dracula. I mean you know you you don't have any rights issues there you know so it, it's perfectly able for them to to look at it's classic it's instantly everyone knows who. Dracula is but they obviously put their sort of you know Marvel spin on it um Stan Lee uh, was planning a Dracula book and and Gene Colan heard about it and I think Gene decided that he had to draw this book in fact I think it ran for over 60 issues and he drew every single one of them but at the beginning I think Stan Lee wanted Bill Everett, who was the guy who drew the first issue of, um, well, who created um, Submariner. He wanted Bill Everett to draw it. So Gene Colan took a day off, apparently, of his own time and worked up samples to convince Stan that he was the guy. And you can imagine, you know, with this swirly, he obviously had just showed him the pencils at the time. But Stan took a look, look at his samples and said, yeah, OK, you, you, you've got it. And interestingly, um, Gene based his Dracula on, instead of the usual sort of Bella Lugosi or uh, Christopher Lee, he based his Dracula on Jack Palance, who, you know. Oh, I didn't realise that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Which, when you start to look at it, you know, when you go back, it, it's his, his Dracula is a bit more brutish than a lot of the more suave um, depictions of him. And at this time, uh, apparently, uh, well, Jack Palance was known as a heavy, wasn't he? He was the bad yes. guy. Yeah. I mean, perhaps a lot of listeners will know of him as as is it um, Curly from City Slickers, the the cowboy that takes um, Billy Crystal and <laughs> yeah. Daniel Stern. Yeah. On. I'm trying to think of a more famous film, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got that. <laughs> Probably nowadays he's he's perhaps known for that but he was yeah he was he was quite the heavy he was a he was a, a dangerous looking guy so yeah he, he based the visuals on on jack palance and it started off with a it, it didn't start off particularly um uh, the easiest route they had a few writers before um marv wolfman came on board and they really seemed to click i think they both got on well i think colin talked about having a, a good understanding with with wolfman and and really getting on on with his scripts so yeah for over 60 issues uh, marv wolfman and, and gene colin produced um tomb of dracula and it did exist i think as well within the confines of the marvel universe i think there were uh, occasional sort of um guest yeah. stars yes there were crossovers definitely yeah, yeah. spider-man at one yeah. point might have appeared um, I remember these, you see, from reprints um, yes. in the back of a main title in the 80s. That's, That's where right. I kind of caught these. And yeah. I think there was a British weekly that, that there might have been a, a, a British uh, Dracula weekly as well, which 
I think we had the, the advantage to a certain extent. We'd have seen um, Gene Colan's artwork in black and white, which I do, I, I do think it works so well. But um, the Marvel sort of approach, they, uh, their take on it, it, the Tomb of Dracula was set in in modern de- modern times. It featured uh, Rachel Van Helsing, who was the granddaughter of the original uh, va- vampire hunter from the novel. Uh, there was a guy called uh, Frank Drake, who was, I think, Rachel's boyfriend. Hannibal King was a, a private detective that was was part of the group. Um, I think at some point he ends up getting, I think, uh, I think turned into a vampire. So he's he's a kind of he's that good guy cursed with with the the problem they're trying to cure. And then famously, and of course. You know, most people will will know of this guy more than the Tomb of Dracula comic. Blade, the vampire hunter, was was introduced in the pages of Tomb of yes, Dracula. Yes, he was. Yeah. And uh, now, I mean, obviously, they've just announced that he's he's back for a reboot film, isn't he? Uh, in the Marvel, in the MCU. So I don't know if that means we get Dracula as well. I mean, Marvel does have a history of using Dracula throughout. He's just come back recently in the Avengers, Jason Aaron's Avengers run. He appeared in the 80s in the X-Men, famously turned Storm into a vampire. So maybe they didn't use him in the original. Did Dracula appear in the Del Toro Blade movies? No, I don't think so. No, I don't remember him being in there. But I wouldn't be surprised if if, um, Dracula is quite connected to the marvel universe so it, it'd be interesting to see if they do bring him back in the mcu version but of course i think we've mentioned before blade was very different looking in the tomb of dracula 70s series he had a like a green turtleneck jumper i think he had usually featured in like an orange sports jacket a <laughs> uh, big afro and some crazy uh, green shades, I think. If yeah, I'm, it was the sports. Was... Well, it was the orange sports jacket <laughs> that always got me. But um, I'm surprised. It's one of those few things. I, I guess when they did the films, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't fully in movie mode at that point. If they'd have done those films since they started the true MCU, you would have had at least at some point a reference to that. Yes. Like, he would have had the jacket, you know, like, grab the jacket off a vagrant or something like that as a, as a nod yes. or something. But um, I, actually, I do like the original film, funnily enough, of the yes. series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got, a lot, uh, got a lot of time. Um, Mignola, I think, worked on Blade 2, produced some storyboards, I think, some yes, character he did. designs. Yes, yeah. yeah. Spent a lot of time in Prague, I think, when they were filming in Big Buddies with, with Del Toro. So, yeah, I that's obviously gothic comics for me uh to me dracula i mean i do love gene colon um i think th- there was never a book really that f- fits so well with his style than to me dracula he was obviously very happy working together he did a, a good long run he also spawned dracula um some of the old black and white ads as well which fit very well with the marvel 70s timeline there were quite a few uh black and white oversized mags and a couple of those featured dracula the i was sad to read once i was doing a bit of research for this that actually gene colan apparently was um, forced out of marvel in the 80s because jim shooter just didn't like him now, i don't know if it was personal or professional but apparently um from what i was reading gene colan left marvel to join dc i think and ultimately start work on uh, wonder woman because um, Jim Shooter just didn't, oh, whether it was, that. yeah, no, I didn't until I read that, which I thought was, a, you know, um, he, he produced so much great work at Marvel. But the other thing I think to point out in post um, Dracula that Gene Colan worked on was he did the uh, DC miniseries Nathaniel Dusk. And one thing that was special about, there was two miniseries that he did. It was uh, created using his actual pencil drawings. And it was one of the first instances that I remember seeing where the artist wasn't inked. So his pencils were reproduced. And I think he might have um, put some watercolour on there as well. But really distinctive, gorgeous looking um, 
pages um, produced directly from his his artwork. But yeah, um, I couldn't talk about um, gothic comics, I don't think, without mentioning Tomb of Dracula. <laughs> uh, I guess I haven't strayed too far <laughs> from, from that. Um, I think my choice is a recent comic, recent-ish, um, and that is the series uh, Penny Dreadful, based on the TV series of the same oh, name. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it's kind of a recent one, but it's as the as the subject was gothic comics. This has got just so much gothic in it; <laughs> it, it can't it can't contain itself. Um, <laughs> The TV series was went for three seasons. It was Sky, so it's one of those where I think it had a limited audience because it was purely on Sky in this country. Yeah. Um, but it's it's another one of these fictional literary team ups, very much in the vein of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, um, and it's it's basically a team up to combat supernatural threats uh, against Victorian London and the world in general. Um, and it wasn't really a surprise, I guess, in 2016 when Titan announced they're doing a comic book series for it. Um, it really is. It's, it's a gothic masterpiece, really, because um, as supporting characters, you have Victor Frankenstein uh, and, of course, his monster uh, and Victor's best friend, Henry Jekyll. Um, you've got mm-hmm. Mina Harker in there. You've got Fenton and you've got Dracula himself. Um oh, cool. It has all the tropes of, of gothic horror. Um, you've got spiritualists, mediums, Egyptologists, which is everything you can mention. Um, and the storyline is just gothic, gothic, gothic. Uh, it's right. It's proper gothic literature. Um, uh, horror throughout. Um, I really loved the TV series. It was one of those those few things that not a lot of people I knew were watching it. And it was kind of a special thing that we stayed in and watched and um, live, would you believe, in the days before they they released (laughs) the entire series. Um, uh, I have to say, I am going to do a Mike's Mutterings on this at some point because I've been doing a series of um, comics that are TV adaptations. But um, it is just dripping in Gothic and it doesn't feel like um, like it's a team up. Or anything mm. it's quite so proper opery in style it's got lots of interesting backstories the comic will hold no appeal to anyone that hasn't watched the series oh, okay at all i think as a tv adaptation it does absolutely the perfect job yeah, it yeah. assumes that you are completely aware of the tv series and what it does is it adds a little bit of extra backstory a few origin stories and then it fills in the gaps in the tv series the tv series is quite fast paced and it's got so many different it's one of those slow reveal series and it's got so many mysteries going on by the time you've reached the end of the season you've forgotten that you haven't got the answers to mystery a e f and z um and it kind of fills in all those those parts again the the artist um uh is very good at it's not a detailed comic it's very much shadowy and mm. obscured um it's um yeah it's just an absolutely superb example of the genre um but like i said i'm going to do mike's mutterings on it sometime because it is a bit of a favorite of mine so i've been saving that for a while um Perfect. but it's, it's actually written by the script writers of the show oh uh, that's good so that's why I can't recommend it to anyone that hasn't seen the series. So yeah. watch the series, then read the comic. Superb. Um, it's Louis de Martinez that's the artist, uh, and I think it's just a perfect choice. Um, it, it, you didn't want a clear, concise artist with lots of detail for this. Yeah. You want it to keep in the shadows and um, get that obscurement in there. So Yeah, um, exactly. It's all about mood, isn't it, really? Gothic yeah. comics. You want mood, really, over over everything else. Exactly. Um, I mean, really, why didn't I choose the lead, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? This reminds me so much. But I think I didn't choose that because the League is just so much more than Gothic because it covers yes. every genre and every timeline if you go beyond the first book. Um, and I guess that, that that's why. Um, 
But I, I have to obviously make the nod that I think Kevin O'Neill is just the master of gothic artwork. Yeah. Um, you, when you read the first volume of, uh, of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen or the first um, few volumes of Nemesis the Warlock I was that he did, Nemesis, yeah. I mean, he throws in gothic architecture mm. and, then, and, and then adds gothic to it mm. uh, as a backdrop even. So I think I had to had to mention Kevin O'Neill. Um, There's a lot of holding back, to be honest, on, on some of these. I, I think, you know, we've our regular listeners will obviously almost be able to think they know who we're going to say in certain <laughs> instances because I feel like I have been on a bit of a broken record perhaps when I'm talking about some creators or yeah. some some hell related characters you know uh, purposefully so yeah I mean I um I could have talked about um which uh, which uh, which hunter on this one as well with um Mignola's most of Mignola's creations being existing within a, in a gothic universe. Yes. But I, I have tried to um, not repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the second sort of event, it's a cinema event, isn't it? That we're going to talk about next. So it some... is. As always with the festival, they do mm. like to stick a few films. Um, and I think, I think over the last couple of festivals, it's becoming uh, a lot clearer themed what they're doing yeah. with the films, which I really like. Yeah. Um, and what they've what they've got is on the Friday night, on the 11th of October, they're doing a double bill um, of Shaun of the Dead and Dawn of the Dead, uh, which is the 2004 remake. Um, and then they're also doing on the Sunday the Stink of Flesh which is actually introduced by star of the film, uh, and I'm going to get this name wrong, Curly Twapoya. Um, uh, and I do actually know who this is because he kind of was in a documentary um, that I realised that I didn't know him from the documentary, but I, I have actually uh, seen it all about um, uh, Kaufman. Uh, and his kind of genre of films. Oh, and I yeah. think it's very much in the same style. It's right. a comedy, and I know about this film because somebody told me about it. Okay. Um, um, so they have very much gone. I think with Dawn of the Dead, there's a good, strong sense of humour in there. So I think they've gone with more comedic right. uh, zombie um, stuff here. Um, but Dawn of the Dead is still a serious uh, zombie film in my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I guess really um, what I was uh, what I suggested on this one was our best and worst zombie film. <laughs> uh, and I, well, very neatly, uh, they're showing um, one of my favourite um, zombie films ever, which is Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> the original 1978 um, was a big one for me um, because uh, when I was a kid, I had access to every video uh that, that was out at the time because my dad and my uncle uh, ran one of the first video Ooh. shops in north wales and that was my first job <laughs> in inverted can, commas can i, I ask you mike <laughs> can i ask you did you sell lifetime membership I always no, remember when this no. when the video shop sprang up, most Ooh. of them they advertised lifetime membership, which I always wonder if um if I had ever taken out, I mean I think my my dad obviously was a, was a member, but I, I I loved the way that they termed it back then that it was lifetime membership of a video library. You know what? <laughs> I've got a horrible feeling that that was just what you called it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean uh, to show how early this was. Um, it really was. It was the first video shop uh, yeah. in North Wales. Um, it was called PM Video, um, and that was named after. It was my uncle Phil mm-hmm. had a van, and it was Phil's mobile video. Uh, and he had this little van, and he used to drive around. Yeah. And he, and he'd know, and he'd drive up a street like an ice cream van here. Yeah. <laughs> and people would come out, and you wouldn't just rent a videotape because you wouldn't have anything to play it on. You yeah. rented a video recorder to play the tape on. Brilliant. That's yeah. how old this is. Mm. And the shop was divided in two. V- 
VHS and Betamax. Right. And there was actually some Philips 2000 as well. There was a single shelf of those. <laughs> that, that's how original this this, this shot was. Awesome. Um, but from a very young age, I did have access to any film I wanted. Um, and yeah, on my 11th birthday, I had a video party, which was Dawn of the Dead. Hey. This was so wrong for that age group. <laughs> but me and all my mates, we were, we were just video mad. And of course, I... I think I was the only kid that not only had had a household that had a video recorder, which was which was of wooden construction, but I actually had one of my own video recorders in my bedroom. Which Whoa. Really, this was just unheard of at this time. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it was a superb thing for a kid. It really was. Um, but that it remains one of my favourite films. And then in 2004, um, they did a remake of it. Uh, Zack Snyder was the director. Um, uh, and it was so divisive because, um, like a great mate of mine, Joe, he just refused to like this film because it had fast zombies, right? And therefore wasn't Romero. Now, there were fast zombie films before, and I completely agreed with him, but this. I just thought it was such a superb update of the of the actual the theme of consumerism and it, the, the visuals in this film I just absolutely loved uh, and for years it had to be a guilty pleasure because most of the zombie loving film audience hated it as well because it wasn't Romero mm. and I think it absolutely is in intent um, and I just really like it um, and the great thing is you recognise so many people in it now yeah. Um, it, Ving Rhames sort of like came quite famous off it. Sarah Polly was was the main sort of actress who is one of these. Um, she doesn't do a lot of films or TV or anything. She I think she she does mostly stage. Um, but I thought she was brilliant in it. Um, and it's just yeah, um, both of them are are my top um, zombie film. It just absolutely has to be. Uh, and the great thing is. I love this film so much. Um, um, you can't watch Modern Family in quite the same way. This <laughs> Phil from Modern Family is in this as the complete opposite of it's Phil. Such a total, uh, isn't he? <laughs> he is, he's absolutely horrible in it, uh, and it makes me laugh so much. But the uh, the classic um, amongst my friends that absolutely love this film, um, the cult part of it for us uh, has always been when they're doing. They're basically bored. They're, they're stood on the, the top of the Midwest um, shopping mall and they're taking pot shots at zombies. <laughs> but in order to actually identify which zombie the next person has to shoot at, they're basically doing celebrity lookalikes with the favourite being Burt Reynolds. And there's a guy with a dodgy moustache and a bit of a uh, smoking the bandit jacket going on. Um, and that's become a bit of a trope between us um, for, for, for people spotting. We kind of do zombie people <laughs> yeah. spot it instead of thing. um but anyway uh absolutely superb film um and it also leads me directly into the worst zombie film ever oh. and that is the 2008 remake of day of the dead oh um, yes it's just makes me one. so angry um yes. yes is that the one um it's not it's like intelligent zombies is it the, 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 there's a kind of um utopia city and a kind of um have i got it wrong have i got it wrong no oh, i think that there is actually a further sequel which might be that one okay <laughs> that's even worse <laughs> even worse I, I, i'm starting at the source of this rot okay <laughs> Uh, Day of the Dead, the 1985 version, again, absolutely superb. One of uh, It's a Romero masterpiece. Um, and the whole sort of concept of it is it's science against military. Right. Okay. So they've taken that theme for, for this one. Um, and they've also taken the idea, and I think this is where, 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 the, uh, where the possible sequel spawns from. They've got the idea of Bub again, which is sort of like a domesticated zombie, a zombie that's retained some of its intelligence, right? Right. Okay. Uh, and that's about where it ends. It, other than that, it bears no resemblance. And it's it's the first remake I've ever seen that looks like it's got a lower budget than the original. <laughs> it's, there's no point to it. Um, Ving Rhames is actually in this 
yeah. slightly. Yeah. And he purely must have accepted a massive payoff just so that there was some link between what people thought was the highly successful 2004 Dawn of the Dead remake from Zack Snyder. So this is just an unknown director. The, yeah. the only semi-recognisable name in it is Mina Suvari, who was in American Beauty. Um, oh, yeah. A lot older than she, she was in American Beauty at this point, but doesn't look like she's aged a day. And she's supposed to be uh, in the army. And when she's in army uniform, in the camos with the cap, she looks like an eight-year-old girl playing dress-up. <laughs> she's the most unconvincing soldier you will ever see in your life it's awful acting terrible dialogue um i just don't know where to yeah it's just awful uh anyway that's that's my rant over uh, well go on. funnily enough i've got done the dead as well for my favorite original no, I, remake or, or no the 2004 right cool yeah because funnily enough i I didn't really watch. Uh, I didn't really watch, to be honest, a lot of horror films. I watched them growing up. I watched them on on video. We'd go to the pictures and watch whatever was on that week. So you know, it was around sort of Nightmare on Elm Street, or you know, we would watch quite a lot um, Evil Dead. But past that, I didn't really. Me and my wife wouldn't choose necessarily to watch a horror film for the longest time until my eldest daughter daisy she started reading charlie higson's uh ya series i think the first one was called the enemy and they were essentially a kind of ya reimagining of zombies so it was actually a kind of age where it kicked in rather than a kind of virus so once you became an adult you became the enemy you became a sort of zombie and large these groups of kids would band together to combat the the zombie adults and she loved these books so as well as it sparking an, an interest um it was well, as long as it it sparked an interest in horror films for her particularly zombie movies so i suppose she would have been i don't know 12 to 14 something like that so there was a certain sort of era where we just watched a lot of zombie movies and we did go back and watch uh but it was dawn of the dead was that the original no night of the living dead was the first night of the original yeah it was the original um not as old as you think it just happens to be filmed in black and white yeah uh and then it was dawn of the dead then day of the dead right uh, but we we do have romero sequels after that as well right um, so we did go back and watch the very first one because i'd i'd read about that in in movie bags but um it if you're not I, I think if you've not grown up and and watched it progress it did seem a little tame in comparison to you know what what we've seen since absolutely but it yeah. defined what modern yes zombie films are almost the it? tropes yeah. are introduced aren't yeah. they you know and the element of of dread being through numbers rather than through a singularly sort of powerful entity that was what i always found was the creepiest thing about zombies was that they were just you know there was, was no end to them um but dawn of the dead i remember when we we ended up we went through lots and we've watched lots since you know um but i remember being instantly pulled into dawn of the dead by the opening scenes that first sort of morning after is so brilliantly done it is superb isn't it isn't it, it? and it's um, it's all one shot almost isn't it yeah it's very quick cut and again yeah. sarah polly is just superb Super. lightning quick responses but just the whole mm. running and the, the the cars almost hitting people and then uh, yeah absolutely superb uh, and, and i could watch that you know over and over and then you've got this sense of the world as well because it sort of pulls back at one point i think when um she's on the road and you get a a, a real view of the expanse and you've got various plumes of fires and you've got the city in the background that's aflame i think you see the helicopters and the planes falling from the sky as well 
the depiction of the apocalypse in in that first i don't know if it, it goes by so thick, uh, quick quick yeah. is it 10 minutes i mean it might not even yeah. be 10 minutes it might be five but i think that's that's the go-to thing when when it was like favorite horror mi- movie and then of course like you say it gets a bit more comedic um and the group they they're in the shopping mall and and they are they're up on the roof and i yeah i I think it's one of the first few uh, zombie movies that I just really, really enjoyed. And with extra geek credentials, of course, because James Gunn wrote the screenplay as well. Yes, he did, yeah. So, um, yeah, we've got that on DVD, and we will go back and rewatch that one. And like you say, uh, with. When well, we... I, I hope you have the extended. All oh, right. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I have to check. Actually, you know what? I think they. I think they just did the extended as the DVD as release. The DVD. It'll say on the top though. Yeah. yeah. Oh, There's quite a bit extra from the original. I've got the the box set that's got the original cinematic release, and it does actually add quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. No, I I really enjoyed that, and you know we've we've watched it. It still remained. We watched as a family. We watched Walking Dead, which surprisingly, you know, my wife again, who wasn't particularly a horror fan, absolutely adored the TV show. So that became a big firm uh, family favourite. Um, but we, yeah, we do actually have a bit of a tradition in in the Williams household, which has now been held up for over a decade, and that is on <laughs> on New Year's Eve, post midnight, I should say. No matter what we're doing, whether we've had, unfortunately, I have to say, now in later life. You have quiet New Year's Eves, but <laughs> occasionally we still rock the boat <laughs> and we still go out to a party. But no matter what time you get in, before you actually go to bed, we have to watch a zombie film. Oh, right, okay. We've done it for 10 years. I've got no idea why I started it, um, but I refuse to let it die. <laughs> <laughs> Although, to be honest, I think it's kind of it's a fun thing. And I think anyone, if we have guests specifically as well, uh, they they expect it as well. Um, but Dawn of the Dead was that was two years ago. Yeah, the year before we did well, what we did was we we saved up the last three episodes of a Walking Dead series. Actually, that was the first time we did a non-film. But last year, I think um, I have to say this is probably my second favourite um, zombie film. We did World War Z. Oh yeah. Because um, I loved the Max Hastings book. Um, mm. Have you have you shown that to yeah to Dave? That was that was the first one actually. I think it was a fifteen, wasn't it? And I, can't remember. I think well, I managed to sneak her in. It's the one time we've managed to get. I couldn't get her in to see World's End of all things, which oh. was a fifteen. But somehow, I, I managed to get her into World War Z. So <laughs> that was the first sort of her first horror movie at, at the cinema. So we, we both went to see that. Yeah, we both. I, I've not read the book. So and I've had lots of really discussions with people. Plastic. Yeah, I've, I've read I've, I've, I've read about the differences in the book and I've had really passionate friends who really hated the film because it wasn't the book. But <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was that was quite a lot of a lot of people mm. said that. But I think what they what they did was they took the best bit, some of the best bits mm. or some, some of the best filmable bits yeah. from the book. And then they strung it into an actual coherent storyline. The book is just a series of reports from around the world. Yeah. And it's kind of segmented into um, whilst, as, whilst it's happening during and, and after. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, it's really you need to, to, to read the book. It's yeah, it's mind blowing the ideas in it. It's lots and lots of little short reports, right. and some of the ideas are just unfilmable. Um, even though the film has some brilliant visuals, such as um, the Walls of Jerusalem, and they're all just oh. piling on top of each other to get up. Yeah, that is, is <laughs> that was just filmable, I think, mm. and to be able to make it look realistic there are bits in the book which are far more epic yeah and i think they would have struggled even with today's technology to actually do it justice um yeah, yeah. the thing i enjoyed That's most a good introduction for her <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, no, she was gay. It was funny. I was in, I was enjoying myself as well. The, I was watching a, a whole genre of stuff that I hadn't really explored, and you know, and found that you know sometimes you cut yourself off from these things because you think you're not going to like them, or you you'd prefer to watch something else, and not at all, you know. So it's just another area. But the thing I particularly enjoyed about World War Z was that expansive view of the world. The fact that a lot of the time um, zombie plagues can be um, defined to too small an area. I think it was one of my frustrations with Walking Dead to a certain extent is I wanted to see what was happening in the wider world and not just in sort of Georgia or wherever they were. And the fact that World War Z showed that pandemic spreading and you, you did have a global view of the crisis um I, I i yeah i i thoroughly enjoyed that and you know i think since uh, i remember being perhaps a little more perturbed and not understanding uh fast zombies at first because they did seem so different but i think you know i've read since that people say you know have suggested that all zombies start out fast and then because they're dead it's just a matter of themselves wearing themselves out and they end up shambling you know so yeah that that works as a theory for me that all well, zombies start out fast that, I think. that's why you need to read the book because it, it answers all those questions like, yeah well don't they just eventually rot well yeah kind of um and the one thing that saved people was by going like north as possible because right. yeah. they haven't got anything for body temperature so they freeze a lot quicker than you do yeah um yeah it kind of answers those kind of questions yeah. quite a yeah bit. it's perfect she's got the is it the zombie survival handbook that you wrote yes, max brooks kind of, yeah. wrote yeah this i mean i remember buying her that thinking oh this is great because i'll be able to read it after it <laughs> and the trouble is you know she's daisy's always got a massive pile of books and there's some that she will just refuse to let me read until she's read them so uh, I, i'm still waiting to read the the handbook there's a strange prophecy in that film as well. Well, when he lands in England, he goes straight to the World Health Organization Centre, doesn't he? Yeah. Or, or WHO, for short. Yeah. And who does he meet? Peter Capaldi. Oh, yeah. He's who, a doctor. <laughs> who became Doctor Who. He's a doctor Brilliant. for Who. in the, oh, quite, quite a weird one. He's one of those things you only realise after the event. So, That's cool. That was uh, before it was announced. So, prophetic film. Well, my worst one is connected with my uh, watching the films with Daisy as well. Because Daisy was a huge fan of the Resident Evil series. Which... Uh, she was obviously a, a massive fan of uh, of the heroine, and I enjoyed watching the the evolutions. I enjoyed seeing the different genre shifts in the in the movie. So you'd get you know you've got your kind of desert cowboy westerny one, and you've got your inner city inner city tower block one. They weren't always great, but we generally enjoyed watching them. Daisy in particular was was a lot more closely related to them so she would have her list of you know the ones that met her targets and didn't but then uh i remember she was so excited for the last one we sit down to watch it and i don't know how far we got in it wasn't very far i think it was about 15 or 20 minutes and bless her she's in tears she's <laughs> she's like dad this is awful <laughs> oh this is awful you know and uh we didn't finish watching it and it was you know for her it was this it was the opposite of end game you know this was a culmination of a series of films she'd invested in thoroughly enjoyed we'd all watched them together and um it ended in in tragedy for her so i can't even remember what the name of it is i should have researched it final but, chapter i think it's called yeah but, it's, um, we we are fans as well in this house. We uh, I like them because I think um, we we used we, we're not big game players, but we did play yes the first couple of Resident Evil games. Yeah. So I get that that got us into the movies and stuff. Uh, and I quite like the fact that every now and then the movies do the proper um, 
they go into video game mode. And so yes. if it was a normal if it was a normal movie, you'd think, God, the script on this is awful. But yeah. they're actually kind of delivering it in a video game mode. Mm. Um, and that that's kind of makes you smile if you've played the games. But um, the last one was a disappointment. I did watch it to the end, and I think she needs to. Um, but I think it felt a bit rushed out that one. Mm. I think that I think she had decided it was going to be her last action role um, for various reasons. I, I guess maybe age. I don't know. Maybe because mm. she, she was she did do a lot of her own stunts and stuff and her own fighting. Yeah. Um, and it, I don't know. It, it, it didn't, it didn't hit the right buttons for me either, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah. Um, I, especially as the, the previous film kind of, it, they all, they always, the nice thing about the films are quite like the cliffhanger that goes into the next film. Yeah. And it was a brilliant cliffhanger. And then that, this film doesn't do what you think it was going to do with it. Yeah. I think that uh, was, at all. she'd got her expectations built up, I think really. But um, yeah, it's it's something that we still we still enjoy. If there is a you know, um, is it Train to Train to Bukan was one I think one of the more recent ones we we'd watched. Was, uh, oh, that's the, the Korean foreign Korean. I think. Yeah, yeah, that was an interesting yeah. one. Yeah, yes. and and when they do have that nice interesting take, it is that genre that you know somebody can um, have a real sort of like. Uh, K zombie, K zombie is a genre. Oh, Kore- yeah. There is okay. a big sort of like Korean zombie kind of, uh, and and it is different from Hollywood as mm. well, or or indie, um, it, British indie stuff. Yeah. Well, it's great as well that I always appreciate that Daisy didn't mind a subtitled or, or foreign movie, you know, which you know I think some some kids are a bit fussy about because we've watched a lot of, uh, of different genre films from around the world and. I think I don't know if it is Korean, but have you seen the host? Oh yes, that is Korean. It is, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's a that's a good it's film. A good movie. It's a really good movie, and it's a monster movie. So that made you know I love I love my monster movies, but you know a really scary monster movie with you know real tension in it. So yeah, we still we still talk about that one. That's uh, that's another favourite. Uh, yeah, well. Zombie movies. So now I think we're moving on to um, now. Is this a panel banned censorship in comics? It is. It's a panel discussion. It's on Saturday the twelfth, um, half ten to half eleven. Um, it's going to be screen two, I think, at the at the brewery. Um, it is. It does advise that there's adult content, eighteen plus. <laughs> um, and it's banned so. censorship in comics in the 21st century. Um, comics have long been the vanguard of freedom of speech. How far can this role be maintained in an era of left and right authoritarianism where no platforming, safe spaces and fake news trump truth seeking and critique? Uh, Darren Cullen, artist, activist, um, Elon's uh, Tony Bennett, uh, Charles Brownstein and Kate Charlesworth join Tim Pilcher to explore this question. Awesome. That sounds good. That sounds like a good one, though. I I looked up and I'd seen the list before, but um, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund website mm. has a page. Did you look this this one up? It has a page of um, banned and challenged books um mainly through american libraries in this yes instance. i was going to mention that yes it's great isn't it i've got it's some in... fantastic examples written down <laughs> oh, it is absolutely amazing when you look through this list and some of the some of the books we've we've mentioned often we've mentioned i mean for instance league of extraordinary gentlemen today which is yeah. on the list um but yeah challenges usually through american library the first time i met uh, i went to this page was because I found Bone by Jeff Smith had been um, challenged in American libraries. And, you know, massive Jeff Smith fan, a, a book that's hugely important to me and my daughters because we would read the um, 
scholastic reprints. I bought the first few trades when they were self-published by Jeff in cartoon books. And then Scholastic picked them up sort of, who would it be, mid, mid-90s? mid And they released um, slightly smaller but coloured versions of Bone. And we would read them as, as a bedtime story. And um, or I would read them doing all the different voices of the characters as best I could remember. <laughs> Thinking, I chose him. I thought, oh, Bone. He's obviously the main character. Bone, Bone. He's like, you know, uh, yeah, I'll, um, I'll, he'll have my voice because he's obviously talking the most. And I gave the, the character who does talk the most, which is his, uh, his brother, the most gravelly hard to um, to do voice at all. So I would always end up with you know, voiceless after story time. But yeah, Bone by Jeff Smith, a uh, lovely fantasy all ages book, was challenged in uh, Minnesota for promotion of smoking and drinking. <laughs> uh, it was, I think, ultimately rejected by a 10 to 1 vote. A letter from Jeff Smith was read out. But yeah, you know, um, there's a lot of recurring, you know, uh, challenges on, on some of these, you know, like obscene um, scenes or sexual content um the graveyard wow. book from neil gaiman that's that's listed under violent imagery yeah um and this was one of my favorites actually there's a there's a book by morris sendak in the night kitchen and it was challenged for nudity i think the main character basically doesn't have any pants on in the night kitchen was not often removed from shelves instead librarians censored it by painting underwear or diapers over the genders <laughs> of the main character. A precocious child named Mickey. <laughs> it, it is hilarious reading the list, actually. Isn't it? I noticed it's on there. Um, uh, Electra has been banned, um, but Tank Girl was yeah. banned in... Uh, I can't remember where. I think it was somewhere weird like Mississippi. But Yeah, Indiana. Um, Indiana, was it? Uh, interestingly, um, Mariko Tamaki, who was at last year's festival, um, have you read her This One Summer? No. It, it's, it's a really, really mm. sweet book. It honestly it's amazing, yeah. Um, it's about um, the friendship between a couple of sort of like preteen girls. And it's kind of, right, it's one of these books where it really explores sort of like topics that are absolutely what a sort of 11, 12 year old girl should be reading. Yes. OK, yeah. um, but it got banned. And again, with these categorizations of why it got banned, unfamily. Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's loads of them like that. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the time, actually, unfamily is is actually referring to um, non-straight relationships. Yeah, that's that's kind of but that it's all middle America. But that uh, sounds like that to me sounds like a phrase that itself has been kind of censored as well on family. It, it, it is. They're not saying what they're talking yeah. about. It's yeah. absolutely clear to me that that's what they're doing. Um, yeah, it's um, funnily enough, the comic book legal defense fund. I think that's one of the charities on one of the current, um, you know, the humble bundles. Yeah. Find digital comics. I think that's whichever. What? Well, I've just recently in the last month or so done one and that was the charity funnily enough oh brilliant yeah yeah Yeah, they do that there's one here actually sandman by neil gaiman reason challenged anti-family themes offensive language and unsuited for age group uh gaiman had a great response when asked about how he felt when sandman was labeled unsuitable for teens gaiman responded I suspect that having a reputation as adult material that's unsuitable for teens will probably do more to get teens to read Sandman (laughs) than having the books ready and waiting on the YA shelves would ever do. Absolutely. Absolutely the perfect way to think it. Saga, reason challenged, sexual content, anti-family. Anti-family, sorry, that's the phrase, yeah. Um, Oh, and this one, this was a cracker, actually. Uh, Pride of Baghdad. Have you read that? No. It's a Brian K. Vaughan book, and it's principally about um, the animals in the zoo in Baghdad that were of 
who was affected by the um, conflict uh, over there. I can't remember when it was published, but um, it was uh, location of challenge, various reason challenge, sexual content, despite receiving high praise and featuring a cast consisting mainly of animals. The book has been challenged at libraries for sexual content. Essentially, you know, it the, the animals in the book talk. It is, a, you know, anthrop anthropomorphic in that sense. Um, but it doesn't doesn't stop people from complaining about the, the sex, despite the main characters being animals. Yeah, astoundingly. So, so, so Vaughan's had two censored so far then, with the with that and the saga. Mm. Yeah, uh, he's not doing well. <laughs> I mean, Mouse, you know, Mouse by Art oh, Spiegelman. Yes. Uh, Anti-ethnic and unsuited for age group. Anti-ethnic. You know. Um, it's absolutely suitable for that age group because that's when I read it. Because I think is it is the age group they're talking about? Is it twelve to something? Was one of the it, it's it's one of the categories that the American libraries used, and yeah. it's what we'd call teen, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly when you should be reading things like that. Completely. Um, yeah. So, um, well, I think is it my turn to go first? I I don't know if this is a bit of a cheat. But it, it's it's it is connected. It's not um, been banned for any of the reasons that we mentioned. But I did uh, I have a personal connection to, I suppose, to a certain extent, to having owning a book that had been recalled and ordered pulped by the publisher. Um, this was in 1999. DC Comics released the Elseworlds 80 page giant, which was a kind of annual. They used to do a lot of these kind of 80 page annuals back, uh, annuals back then. So it had about, I think, six short stories written by different creative teams and nestled. Very forgettable. I have to say, I did go back and look up online uh, which, which stories it contained. I bought it. I remember when I flicked through it, I was a big Cal Baker fan. Still am a massive Cal Baker fan. I, I, I love his cartooning. He's funny. He's got a great view on things. He did a story in there with um, Liz Glass. Liz wrote it. Kyle drew it. And it was called Letitia Lerner, Superman's Babysitter. And it was a tale of Mar and Pa Kent going out for the evening and leaving Letitia to look after uh, super baby right. and it does have a, a feel very much of um there was a roger rabbit short that was released i think you could get it on the it was on the dvd and it was basically roger rabbit um and he was babysitting for baby herman yeah. there's a there's a short bit in the film where they they you, you see them filming it and then they they go cut and then they move out well there's an actual short so it's basically the baby getting into pre precarious situations and Roger trying to save him and then, you know, getting stabbed with um, knives through his clothes or getting electrocuted on the stove, all these kind of things. It's a similar thing, really, uh, in this instance. The baby is, you know, um, crawling all around the kitchen and um, falling, climbing up on the roof and crawling across a highway and the babysitter the entire time time is trying to keep him safe and then right at the end she's cooking um she's cooking the tea and instead of putting the chicken in the microwave she puts the super baby in the microwave and literally <laughs> there's one panel there's one panel <laughs> where you've got super baby in a microwave it, it, that's of the time though isn't it yeah. <laughs> there was this big thing about microwave ovens and the danger of microwaving yeah. your baby yeah. oh. apparently Paul Levitz who was the editor and vice president of DC Comics at the time he strenuously objected to little Clark Kent being shown uh, in this way and he ordered uh, he ordered it to be recalled and pulped but Back in 99, I suppose nowadays you just send an email to every comic shop or Diamond's able to do that. But the, you know, lines of communication in 99 weren't that 
um, um, you know, quick. And I remember being in London. I picked up a copy of this from the shelves of Comic Showcase. And it had obviously got on the shelves overseas because the message didn't get out quick enough. So um, I, I looked on, online. I think there's very few people suspect there's as few as like 700 copies. I was going to ask, have you looked up the price of it? Well, unfortunately, I don't. It's one of I don't still have it. Uh-huh. I know. I I didn't have that much space in you know in London where we were where we were living, so I had to be quite uh, you know tight with what I kept and what I didn't keep at the time. And I remember the only good thing in it was this um, Kyle Baker. Uh, strip and i do remember just oh, i had to make some space someday yeah and i i, I threw it out yeah that, that's happened to every comic collector mm-hmm. it's uh, several points in their lives they yeah. have to condense and, cult. yeah and it's funny there are still some comics that i am various i you know every time we moved we moved pretty much every two years in london we lived you know north east we didn't leave live south and every time you move, you, you, you know, you do a quick sort of call and keep on top of stuff. Some things might, if you were lucky, you could move them back to your mum and dad still. But, you know, you, were, you weren't as settled as, as you are now. But I, there are a good list of comics that I could probably write out that I regretted getting rid of them. Um, I don't know if this would be on there, actually. Money-wise, it might be. But that strip was great. And you can still see it online. Um, there are a couple of blogs that have, have posted it up. But interestingly... Um, the story eventually won an Eisner Award, and it's since been reprinted in um, various DC Comics collection. They they reprinted it in the Bizarro Comics collection. But yeah, nice. they're self-censored, but equally, yeah, the um, this was one comic that got banned, got pulped. That I had a copy and then pulped myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was well I had to think quite hard about this really because I think I did the same as you I I'd, I'd actually come across an article once about about all the different band comics and it actually pointed you to probably the same website you were talking about was, was that the yeah. actual comic book legal defense fund site was it That's right, right yeah um there's a few there's a few places that uh, that I found that do like all the listings and came across saga and all those ones as well um pretty much everything you read out um, but I was trying to think of like, well, that, that's American. That's, that's not here. Um, thankfully, that doesn't. That it's a lot rarer, I think, in this country. Um, yeah. But I was trying to think of like more personal instances, um, and I was trying to think of a band and a censored. So I remember back in 1990, one of my favourite comics ever um, from Fleetway. Um, is Crisis magazine. Um, yeah. It was the more adult version of 2000 AD at the time, um, filled a similar slot to Revolver magazine. It had a lot of my favourite artists in it. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I had the chance, thankfully, to meet um, John Wagner and Carlos Esqueras at the festival. I've probably told yeah. that story a few times. <laughs> I presented them with a brand new polished edition of um of uh, hardback of uh, dread collected stories which they'd not actually seen themselves um i was only showing this to carlos and he suddenly called john over who i didn't see who stood behind me uh and they realized that uh, they were quite unhappy with it because it failed to give acknowledgement to certain people it should have cool. um, but whilst i had them both there um I asked them all about crisis because there was a story in there that they did third world war, which um, it, it made a bit of an activist of me. It was that time in my life um, as you are around sort of uni age and it's sort of um, you start getting a, a bit more of a worldview in your life. Um, and it's a superb political piece and it's probably resonates more now. 
and I, and I asked them about reprints and they really weren't sure, but there was discussions going on, uh, which I can thankfully say in January it's coming out. Brilliant. It's being republished. But there was lots of stories in Crisis mm. that were superb. And it was kind of one of those sort of push the boundaries slightly type comics. Um, and they advertised, and I was looking forward to, uh, an early collaboration from Pete Milligan and Brendan McCarthy, which is Skin. And they never printed it. It was advertised heavily. Yeah. And Fleetway, who um, who produced Crisis, basically had cold feet. Yeah. Uh, the reasons they cited was extreme violence. Yeah, tick. Racism. <laughs> um, racism. There's a racist language used, but it's. I, I, you have to understand the the context, which I'll mm-hmm. go into, and political viewpoint. Um, it's all about skinhead culture. But this is about original skinhead culture, um, as in the roots from like the mods and the West Indian rude boys coming together. It's a working class movement. Uh, it's multicultural. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's um, <clears throat> it was um, LBGQT friendly as such for the time. Uh, in fact, there were sort of skinhead. There was like a gay subculture in there originally as well, uh, which is what makes it all the more bizarre when skinhead culture was appropriated by white nationalist racists, mm. because they were absolutely the opposite of that. Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, nowadays, um, that's what most people just associate there. Um, so it actually even explains in the book itself um, there are there is racist terminology in there, but it also explains the bad language. It was the working class language of the time. They were trying to be authentic, mm-hmm. and it's given full context because of that in a historical way. Um, so I, I, so it's just because they banned it for racism, it is not racist in any way. I don't have to say that. But um, it was actually banned, but it was actually published two years later. But I never saw it for years and years and years mm. because uh, at the time I didn't have a comic shop um, and it really had a very limited release. And a lot of what was controversial or impactful about it was kind of it wasn't as impactful when it came out. and I read it, should mm. we say. Um, it's basically about uh, Martin Atchip, who is. Uh, a skinhead um and it really what the whole story is a bit of a love letter to skinhead culture in a way because brendan mccarthy the artist was did actually grow up in skinhead culture um but martin atcher is actually a victim uh born of the thalidomide scandal um which is the the drug scandal i think from the 50s onwards was a wonder drug for morning sickness mm. but caused the horrible thalidomide deformities in babies um and it's it's only a short short little little book it's about uh, a skinhead lad who is incredibly angry and his disgusting behavior stems from this anger and it's almost like a revenge fantasy where he confront when he understands who he is and why he is, he confronts the director of the drug company that created Lidamide. And, well, like I said, it's a revenge fantasy. <laughs> um, it's it's short. It's, uh, it, it is impactful still, but I, I, not as much as if I'd have read it back then, I guess. Yeah. Uh, what I love about it also is Pete Milligan, Brendan McCarthy, a bit of a dream team for me. Um, yeah. uh, and I, it's just one of those few examples I can think of of something I was looking forward to, and I was denied it. Um, yeah, yeah, a bit weird. Um, it, would uh, have, it would have fit perfectly, wouldn't it, in in Crisis at the time? It was. It, it was. It was exactly that kind of stuff that Crisis was known for. Mm. Uh, and it, again, it was self censorship because it was Fleetway themselves that had cold feet about it. Yeah. Um, it is it is incredibly violent and yeah the language is 
top notch, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> um, but even so, you know, you're talking about a mature audience comic. I seem to remember buying Crisis. It was it was on the top shelf in newsagents um, with everything that that goes with, because uh, it was seen as a mature audience comic yeah. only. So yeah, yeah. That deadline was that was, that was the absolutely that's that's the golden age of British comics. For me. <laughs> deadline, revolver, crisis, yeah, yeah. Now, I, 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 I'm almost feeling embarrassed at saying this, but I kind of have to. <laughs> I have an example of censorship, but it's incredibly childish from my <laughs> on my side. <laughs> Uh, and this goes back to 1978, uh, although I believe it was probably a year later that we used to get the reprint of the Star Wars comic. Oh, yeah. And in issue eight, <laughs> and I remember that I'm age six or seven at this age, right? Uh, a little known fact, um, there was a character that was introduced who was a green humanoid rabbit <laughs> called yes. Jackson. Do you know that he's been reintroduced? I'd, but he's I'd, been reintroduced into the actual canon universe. Is this the, the new Marvel one? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. I, I was. I was trying to. All I was trying to do was look up the picture for what I'm t- about to talk. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I didn't know. Um, that. <laughs> but yeah, all these. Um, <laughs> there's been people complaining about it, and I was like, <laughs> well, actually, he was. <laughs> and I'm thinking like. I've always known him as a Star Wars character. He's ridiculous, by the way. <laughs> He's a ridiculous character, but he was in Star Wars issue eight here. Um, but in the midst of action, there's, there was this little speech bubble. Uh, and it, he just said, I suggest we get off our fannies and cottontails because trouble's coming this way. Um, now, to a six or seven year old in the late 1970s, I didn't know that the Americanism fanny meant bum. Mm. It meant something different to us. And this caused us hilarity (laughs) at that age. This is so childish, I know, but I was a child, okay? (laughs) And me and my mates, we just, this killed us every time we read it, (laughs) right? So even if you think about the 80s and bum bags came out, it wasn't until later on in American films you heard the term fanny pack. (laughs) Yeah. I told you this is childish. <laughs> but I remember years later, there was a reprint of the story, and it was from the British Marvel arm. Uh, and I should ask John about this, shouldn't I? Um, mm. And when they reprinted it, there was just a, a quite a visible um, white sticker over it so it just said, I suggest we, and then there's this huge space in the bubble. Um, <laughs> Uh, get get our cotton tails out of here or something like that. <laughs> it was so obvious. That they obviously looked at it and just thought, but this was years later, yeah, so yeah. Was like probably like 15, 16. And I was so disappointed because I know the childish 15 year old in me would have sniggered again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was certain, uh, certain books you knew exactly what page to turn to, isn't it, to get the, uh, to get the laughs in school. You, you knew exactly which way, which page to turn. Oh, brilliant! I didn't know he was back. Living, eh? Yeah, I, uh, as soon as I googled it, got a few images up, and um, it looks like it's in like the what's the what's the phrase they use for the younger audience? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, um, well, it's kind of all ages, isn't it? But is it the IDW Star Wars Adventures? Time? Yes, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is uh, been fine. Nick Brokenshire's writing and drawing uh, a oh, few cool. strips, yes. that, yeah, which I've I've um, I've picked up uh, a couple of those. He's, they can't sell it in this country because um, the the term Star Wars Adventures in the UK, I think it's licensed by Panini, so I think it must right. be one of those toy stuffed things that get called comics in the supermarket i think one of those might be called star wars adventures uh whereas the idw one doesn't own the license so it can't get released in this country i think you can get it if you pre-order it from forbidden planet i managed to pick up one by pre-ordering it from forbidden planet and i picked up a second 
from Nick at a con. He's obviously I've a few con- definitely copies. seen a copy of one. Yeah. 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 The um, because strangely enough, Jackson himself as a character was censored as well. Yeah. Um, because there was an awful lot that they did um, in the Star Wars comic. It, it was of, of an age where they didn't really think about continuity and like, oh, cripes, there's a second film that's going to completely ruin what, what we've said. Mm. Um, so they just went off on a tangent and did their own stuff. So, of mm. course, Marvel have retconned all of that in under the Marvel Legends label. Right. Or, uh, so that as you read them, it's like it didn't happen, but you you would hear this as a story in a bar somewhere in a cantina on on such and such world. Uh, it's funny enough, that's got a connection actually with the with the character I've chosen. There's a bit of retconning because of publishing history in the uh, in the next character that um, I've chosen because the next section we've got is my own private hell live draw. Isn't it? Which it that, is. That's... There's, a, there's a Hellboy exhibition on, isn't there? At um, at the brewery again. There it is. Yeah. That's curated by Duncan Fagredo. and because of that, there's um, there's a student competition, isn't there? That's it's closed now, but I've seen some of the uh, the entries. You have to come up with a hell themed superhero for the uh, student competition. So there's various sort of um, hell themed events going on i think because of the the hellboy exhibition uh including the, the live draw which um i've i've been to i've been to one of the um opening um talks with, with this bit of live drawing going on usually the mcgarry's but i haven't been to any obviously because it occurs when i'm usually behind a table but i know i think um Ian went to the zombie live draw, I think, last year. Which yeah, yeah, we went together. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah there was uh, that sounded amazing. Movie. I saw oh, some yeah. shots from that. Yeah, it looked oh, great. Super. So, yeah, I'd love to go to uh, to to one of the live draws. But yeah, so the 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 hell themed uh, draw, my own private hell live draw, um, has caused us to now come up with our favourite, I suppose, hell themed comic hero stroke villain. Yep, I've got the blurb for the event. It's my own private hell live draw. Saturday the 12th of October, it's uh, noon till one. Main theatre. The live draws really do, uh, they, they they go down a storm. I, I mm. really, really recommend it. Um, it's uh, all artists who have all played with fire in very different ways. Uh, Junko Mizuno, Hell Baby. Sean Phillips, Hell Blazer. Duncan Fagrido, Hellboy, and Lawrence Campbell, uh, Hellboy as well. So here they joined forces on stage for the first time to create original Hell-inspired art hosted by Chris Thompson. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds amazing. Oh, if I can get away from the table for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so top Hell-themed comic hero villain. Now, it was very strong, as I mentioned earlier. And I didn't choose Hellboy because that seemed slightly redundant. And I have banged on way too much about, you know, one of my, if not my favourite character. In fact, I was in the comic shop the other day. I didn't realise there was a new Hellboy BPRD series due out. They don't always uh, show up on my pull list a lot of the time because they're separate miniseries. And uh, Simon, who runs the comic shop, said, uh, I said, oh, there's a new Hellboy comic. And he went, oh, you, you actually visit your, your face brightened up then. You had a massive smile on your face. I was like, yeah, it's, it's a new Hellboy comic. It's kind of like, you know, when you don't know it's there and you're looking through your pile, it's like brilliant. But I was strong. I haven't, <laughs> chosen, I haven't chosen Hellboy. I bang on about Hellboy much. And this one I ended up, I, it's actually a heroine. Um, I do like it. She's not a huge star, but there is there's a really interesting history to her and part of that history involves a, a bit of retconning which right. is why it ties into that that last one and the it's hellcat hellcat right. who is the um heroine super heroine who at one time married the son of satan who was another one i was thinking of doing damon hellstrom soon to get his own disney plus show 
So I don't know if uh, they're going to introduce Patsy back into that. She was a supporting character um, on TV in the Jessica Jones Netflix show as well, which I haven't caught the third one, but I, I don't believe I've not heard she turns into Hellcat at any point. But in the comics, uh, Patsy Walker, who's Hellcat's uh, real name, she was actually a teen humour uh, heroine in a, in a teen humour comic. She first appeared in uh, Miss America magazine number two, and that was cover dated November 1944. So, you know, Miss America. Yeah. I've not, not heard of this. OK. Uh, Miss America was in the uh, All Star Squadron. Roy Roy Thomas collected a lot of the kind of lesser known um, superheroes. Uh, the Invaders, which was kind of retconned as, as the kind of big stars in the yeah. 70s, um, they were the big names. So Captain America, Submariner, Human Torch, Bucky, Toro, Union Jack, Spitfire, invented later. But there were lots of others. So things like who was in there now? Um, Miss America. There was a character called Blue Diamond. who had, a, I think he had a piece of kind of alien um quartz in his in his chest right there was a guy Actually. called <laughs> there's a guy called the thin man uh yes who, who was, i've heard of him yeah stretchy and very very flat yeah. uh there was i think red raven who was a kind of um the flying uh superhero type um who else was in there all star squadron i think there was there might have been one called the spirit of 76 who was the kind of Captain America sort of analog? But um, yeah, the, he, he, Roy Thomas loved all of those Golden Age heroes and would would bring them back at the drop of the hat, like he did in the Avengers with the original Vision and things like this. But um, she was, I think, Patsy proved popular enough to you know quickly gain her own series uh, from the backup in Miss America. She was um, a redhead whose boyfriend was Robert Buzz Baxter, and she was uh, rivals with um, another friend called Hedy Wolf. Um, and she, one thing that stands out about her is she's actually one of the few Marvel characters um, who was continued publish, continually published by them from the 1940s all the way through the 1950s the kind of atlas stage uh, atlas stage into the 60s and the silver age of comics so there were patsy walker comics published alongside you know into the the marvel comics era um the only other people that i i saw listed that were um continually published alongside it was uh, millie the model and kid yeah. colt because there were lots I, I of didn't realise it was. I didn't realise the character was that old at all. Well, wow. that's, I, I knew. Well, I knew that she was old. I didn't realise she was continually published. Because even I knew that even popular characters like Captain America, eventually was were not published. His yeah, yeah. his he had his name on a magazine for the longest time, um, and he was he didn't appear inside. Um, and and characters like Submariner and the Human Torch, even though they were very popular in the 40s, during that kind of 50s period when, you know, superheroes fell out of favour, favour, then um, Marvel gave up. They were always continually publishing things. They were always desperate to get new titles on the stands. But if it carried on selling, which obviously Patsy Walker did, um, then they kept producing it. And she was... I think, it looks when you look at some of the covers, it looks very kind of archy territory. So, mm. you know, it's 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 that kind of era. It's going to, you know, going for milkshakes, going to football games, it's it's dating sort of teen comics. Um a lot of the early stuff was um drawn by um, mad creator Al Jaffe, who used to do the, the folding bits in mad and a lot of her early issues featured um a one-page gag strip 
called Hey Look by Harvey Kurtzman. Um, and yet, popular character. Now, the turn in her fortunes occurred when she made her and her uh, friend Hedy, they made a cameo appearance in Fantastic Four Annual Number 3, which was October 1965. Now, this was the um, the marriage of Reed and Sue issue. So, you know, Stan and it, he'd always dropped in, I think, references to old characters and merely the model would get referenced, you know, even in some of the 80s comics that, that yeah, I was reading. That's that's how I know of her. Yeah. It's because of the references. Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. So the fact that they sort of went one bit further and thought, oh, it'd be funny if we put these two characters in, it basically kind of moved her from, you know, from from one iteration of the Golden Age into being, a, you know, a, a, a character who existed in the Marvel Universe at that time. And I think what happened was um, Steve Englehart, who was writing uh, comics, and he started off doing cowboy and teen uh, romance books, so he was probably aware of, of Patsy Walker. He clocked that she'd been included in the Fantastic Four annual and li- literally meant, oh, right, that means kind of like she's been introduced now in the same way, I suppose, that Captain America had. We, we can take her and we can make her a character in the, in the standard Marvel universe. Um, and then he went that one stage first and wrote into her story that all of those previous Patsy and Hedy stories that had appeared from the 40s and 50s were actually fictional stories written by Patsy's mum, Dorothy, yeah, right. that were based <laughs> on Patsy's own life and friends. So just like you were talking earlier about them, you know, um, repackaging the Star Wars books, Steve Englehart essentially takes, you know, 20 years worth of Patsy's stories and says, oh, yeah, they still happened, but they're actually fictional works within this universe rather than an actual comic, you know, um, about what she really did. Which I, that was the bit I didn't realise, actually. Um, I, but it is written into the Jessica Jones TV show as well. Yeah. I didn't quite realise. In, in the Jessica Jones show, Patsy Walker's um, previous fame is because she appeared on a TV show. She was a child actress. Yeah. Yes. So they, that, but I didn't realise there was a, a, a previous reason for them to write it that way as well the fact that patsy walker had this sort of um further background but then she was introduced in um as a character in amazing adventures when Engelhart was writing um, a beast strip this is the strip where the beast from x-men changes from his uh, human with big hands big feet original x-men incarnation into the the furry beast uh in similar to the hulk in his first appearances uh, the original beast was gray in this series before again with like with the hulk they just worked out it was too complicated to try and do gray back then so he ends up moving on joining the avengers and becoming blue in much the same way that um patsy does she ended up um around the same time as the beast i think she ended up being um, introduced as a member. Um, she inherits the costume of another previous character that had been published um, called The Cat. There was a, a, a character called um, Greer Grant Nelson. I think m- the powers from this previous incarnation came from the costume. The name Hellcat was originally something they were going to call the cat, but it wasn't deemed right at the time. So with a few tweaks to the costume, she becomes Hellcats um, in the Avengers. Um, And then later on, I think late 70s, she joined the superhero team, the Defenders. That's probably where I... I think was more familiar with her. That's, I yeah, that's her where I know her from as well. Yeah. yeah. And that's when she met um, Damon Hellstrom. Uh, they eventually marry. Now, 
I can remember them both probably early 80s being in the event in the Defenders. That was, you know, I think at the time we had possibly Beast, Gargoyle, I seem to remember, Moon Dragon. That, you know, Defenders was always that weird team where pretty much anybody could wander in and yeah. share an event. <laughs> Well, they seem to fit in really well. They 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 came they kind of became a sort of um, um, Nick and Nora Charles of the Marvel Universe. They, they were sort of occult detectives for a while, weren't they? A kind of married couple occult investigators. Now I probably lost touch with them around here. I don't. I when I was reading her present history, there were some bits here that I didn't realise had happened. So after I'd stopped reading, Damon Hellstrom's demonic nature asserts itself. Patsy is driven first mad and then in Hellstorm Prince of Lies number 14, she's driven to suicide. Now, that would have been the time that Warren Ellis was writing it. Um, She spends some time in hell, apparently, for for killing herself before tricking um, Hawkeye into somehow resurrecting her in the Thunderbolts annual in about 2000. And since then, she's um, appeared in a couple of um, her own miniseries, I think. She had um, Stuart Immonen drawing uh, a a series uh, that was written by his wife uh, for a time. I think last seen uh, working for Jennifer Walters, as a as a PI in um, She-Hulk, so um, yeah, I didn't realise the later turns, but very interesting to to find out about the sort of how her earlier comics incarnation was then rewritten. Great record, into the story. yeah, yeah. No, I didn't, it was that old oh, crikey. Yeah, it's amazing. see, I know from She-Hulk as well because it was a couple of years ago I, I started catching up with She-Hulk because mm. I, I I don't know I went through a phase of um, do you know characters that are in the Marvel Universe but sort of sometimes sit out the major storylines? Yeah. It's hard to explain. I, I kind of, I kind of um, got into rereading a load of back stuff, and I realised that they were reprinting She-Hulk attorney at large type stuff. Um, and I wasn't reading it at the time. I don't think it interested me. Mm. So I was going back and rereading all of those, so I kind of know her from that as well. Yeah. Um, I I didn't realise. Are, are we were we only supposed to um, pick characters that had hell in the name? No. Oh, right, no, okay. not at all. Because <laughs> <laughs> you went from Hellboy to Hellblade to no, Hellcat. My honourable okay. mention actually was Ghost Rider. Yes, <laughs> that that would have been my honourable mention as well. Really. Yeah. Part too much to talk about really with Ghost Rider. So you know. Yes. Uh, and a slightly you know different story so again much like you with your mutterings i think i'll save ghost rider for a future mutter downs yeah but um yeah and another one who's got those kind of roots but no it it, it was i i didn't think i was going to do hellcat i think but it was one of those that once you start I'd, i've drawn her a few times she's always a character that i've liked and um doesn't necessarily appear as as often as she could and who, who has had that strange, much like Miss Marvel, had that strange, you know, slightly, uh, slightly weird, um, abused um, background in comics mm. with, with, you know, with partners. They've both had, obviously, very dodgy relationships. But um, no, 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 it doesn't have to have hell in the title. <laughs> Who's gone for? Well, um. I actually chose Lucifer himself. Mm-hmm. Um, first debuted in the Vertigo Sandman series um, yeah. back in 8990, something like that. Um, now, obviously, part of the wider Vertigo universe, um, which I still, to this day, I find weird that they that they brought the Vertigo stuff in. But anyway, um, and I, I chose him because. Uh, I think Gaiman wrote a really very nuanced character. Um, It starts off, obviously, with the, well, the basic story of who Lucifer is. Shortly after creation, um, uh, he disgraces himself and is sent down basically to caretake hell for eternity. Um, And Lucifer is the story of how he gets bored 
and moves to Australia <laughs> and then eventually Los Angeles. Um, um, it's one of those characters um, I haven't, I'm not a hundred percent record on reading all of the long series post Sandman. I think there was 75 issues he had on his own. Um, Sandman had 75 issues as well. Yeah. Um, but it was just the character. Um, I just love the way that Gaiman's written him to be manipulative, as you would expect, and completely self-centred, as you would expect, but genuinely thoughtful and charismatic at the same time. Um, and the, the thoughtfulness and the charismatic side, um, I once read from Gaiman himself, um, he kind of took that part of the character from David Bowie. Mm. which is how he instructed the artists to portray him as well. Oh, okay. Um, which is something I didn't get myself, actually. No. When I first read them. Um, but I just love that the whole character is written around the concept of free will and predeterminism. Mm. Um, and I think that's a, sort of like a, some, like a really great subject that you can get your, your teeth into. And I think Gaiman did a fantastic job. Mm. Um, I love the fact that he's he's called Lord of Lies. Despite himself, he refuses to lie. It's a principal thing with him. Mm. He doesn't believe that he should send he should he should send somebody on the path to hell by lying to them. He just tells them the truth because he knows that's going to lead them straight to where they're going to go. <laughs> and, and although it's repeated time and time again in different story arcs, it's done so differently even though it's the same result. Um, I just thought it was very, very clever. Mm. Uh, he's obviously made a few appearances since. Uh, again, as a character, he appears in the original Constantine movie, which doesn't match my view of the character at all. Mm. Uh, but then Constantine in that doesn't actually yeah. meet the, view of the character. doesn't mean it's, a, it's any less of a film, but um, I, I always treat that as a standalone thing. I love the film. But it has nothing to do with the comic series, really. It's heavily inspired, but doesn't really capture him well. Um, and the weird thing is, from 2015 onwards, there was a TV series of Lucifer, which everyone raves about, and I've not seen a single episode. No. Nope. You. <laughs> okay. Also, everyone raves about it, but you have to wait until somebody that's read the comics raves about it. Yeah. Uh, no. Before you even go. But uh, it's just one of those things I've not caught up with. Too much too much i really can't keep up with it i have to uh, say this, this, I, I the only knowledge of lucifer i have is just from sandman i i didn't I didn't read any of his his solo works I've, I've seen them um you know i kind of roughly know of the character but only um only ever caught him in the in the main in the main title really yeah mm. no it's worth catching up on um mm. I, I enjoyed his own series. Like I said, it's patchy for me as well. I don't have it all. Mm. Uh, I might go back at some point to actually you know, buy the various volumes. Um, he got reinvented heavily in the new 52. Right. Um, Did they change and, the line thing? Because I didn't know about the line thing. That sounds, that actually sounds really intriguing, you know, that he, he I, refused. I don't know about the new 52 because i really didn't get into the new 52 to be honest no of him at all mm-hmm. um what the one thing i picked up was that it's really really back to christian roots oh really. okay more mythic uh, yeah we're, well in sandman and and in his series it's not it's there is a god but it brings in all kinds of religions it's not a specific christian god um, he, uh, and it doesn't stick to a Judeo-Christian background to it at all, um, but it seems to be very much down the Christian route, yeah. uh, which is a bit odd because normally mm. it's kind of the way around they do this in comics, isn't it? If they feel something is a bit too Christian, then they kind of open it up mm. um, to, to be sort of, sort of multi-religious. Um, but yeah, yeah, it, it just I it's one of those things. Um, I just I'm desperately behind on the New 52. Um, I read stuff on certain characters and I didn't particularly like them. I'm not massive DC anyway. I'm more Marvel, as you know. Mm. So um, it's just something I'm not really aware of the character going forwards, really. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I, I I do find all of the the events. The fact is, it seems to have settled down a little bit again, which is good. We haven't had the usual sort of renumbering, but that does tend to put me off, and I do use them as jumping off points just as much as people use them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I did jump off a lot in um, New Fifty Two, including Batman, which still gets talked about as one of the success stories of the, the new yes, 52 yeah, it does. i mean um i love greg capullo's art i was enjoying scott snyder but the year zero um, and sort of james gordon rabbit is batman i i dropped that i i was reading morrison's action comics and just found that some of them were just I hate to say badly written. I love Grant Morrison, but they didn't include names for some characters. I swear, in some I was reading, I was like, "What? What's going on?" I mean, I'm, I know there's an element of Morrison where you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to say what's going on, but I, I got a bit fed up um, of, of not having some sort of basic information in, in some of the action comics later stuff. So yeah, but I've actually, I'm actually probably reading a little more DC presently. Um, with them moving towards th- bringing things back, like Legion of Superheroes. There are certain things in DC that I do really like, and some of the Bendis Superman stuff and moving towards the Legion coming back. I'm always interested to see. I'll pop in at the beginning. I don't yes. know. I'm not Whether the biggest. stick around until the end. Yeah. yeah, I'm not the biggest Bendis fan in some senses in that um, there's... I kind of like a bit more to happen perhaps in an issue than can mm. sometimes, you know, I know uh, there's great things talked about is, is Superman stuff, which I haven't been reading. Um, but um, I, I did pick up, I think the first couple of uh, event Le- Leviathan books and um, found them to be um, uneventful. <laughs> really, <laughs> in the sense. But yeah, funny, I'm, I am reading a little more DC at the moment so. i'm i'm actually reading a little bit more and i swear to god it's because of some of the tv series are actually getting me back into like yeah. titans really did get me back into mm. reading some stuff and picking it up my uh, my sister reads more dc than i do and um, she's mm. a huge sandman fan uh, and i know that she likes lucifer so she just happened to be on holiday. Otherwise, I'd have just given her a quick ring and just say, yeah. is Lucifer any good? And I could have acted a bit more authoritarian, <laughs> authoritative about my answer on that. Uh, she could have just given me like a half hour ramble on what's happened. But um, yeah, so. Right. Well, that's that's our hell inspired characters. Um, so last so one. We've, we've, we've left the best to last. <laughs> because I, I think we could go a full hour on this one. <laughs> Don't worry, we've folks. Been, almost over. We've been chomping at the bit for this one, haven't we? <laughs> uh, and we've chosen um, Belgium Comics. Uh, it's an international arts festival, and I like the fact that we get different yeah. countries involved mm-hmm. each year. Um, and on the 12th of October, 1 till 2 at Screen 2 in the uh, Brewery Arts Centre, uh, there is a presentation of Belgian Comics from Hergé to Brecht Evans. Um so, uh, again, no. I've got no idea on the pronunciation of this. Um, Benoit Peters is professor of, I tried a Belgian accent then, uh, is a professor of graphic fiction and comic art at Lancaster University. Partnership with the Lakes International Comic Art Festival and Wallonie Bruxelles International uh, and a world-renowned expert on comics. As part of his annual appearance, uh, Benoit will give a unique presentation on the key players and moments in history of Belgian comics, together with reflections on the Belgian contemporary scene. All Belgian events in partnership with Lancaster University, WBI, Flanders House and the Flemish Literature Fund. So I guess this is one that I'm going to have to force myself to go to because I know so little about Belgian comics. Um, and luckily I get to go first this time because I bet I'm going to, to, I'm going to basically trump you by just saying Tintin in the Smurfs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so all I can say on that is with Tintin, actually, 
I am really well read on Tintin, having mm -hmm. never owned one. Uh, and this is because our school library had every single Tintin book. Cool. And I mean every single Tintin book, which nowadays I guess no library here would have. <laughs> Uh, because of certain um, racial depictions from Hergé, um, which, yeah, I really didn't pick up on that as a kid, and I really mm. thought I would have, mm. and I didn't. No, I know, it's and funny, isn't it? You see it now, and you recoil in horror, but anyway. Yeah, it was just seen as, I, I just saw it as cartooning, I suppose, in the yes. same way. I think it things was, were, it was know. so cartoony, it didn't Yeah. Really, quite so hard maybe and also i suppose to a certain extent we did grow up in a landscape that included some racial stereotypes from a very early age in certainly children's books it was oh, still 70s around TV. yeah and you know the 80s was quite yeah yeah you just you know you had you know robertson's jam and you know the, the giveaways that they would they would do so you know it's it you, you just yeah you didn't question it i suppose till to us till a certain age or until it was it was pointed out i guess i guess i had to mention that but Tintin yeah. generally as a kid yeah um it was lovely bright attractive cartoon um and it was proper adventure um mm. and i think that's kind of what i liked about it but mm. the, the great thing was it was on those days when it was raining outside, you weren't you weren't allowed outside. You were allowed to go to the library, mm. uh, and that's what I used to do with a few friends. And we would basically just sit around a table and we'd all read a Tintin book, and you could just about fit one in. And great, that was your lunchtime. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I've never read or seen the Smurfs. I was aware of them as a kid because there was key rings, stickers, pencil cases. Uh, they've never appealed to me. And I'm thinking, oh, have I missed something? I don't know. I didn't like the aesthetic of them at all. Mm. Um, just something as a kid. And so it's just something I've never gone back to. So I really don't know. Well, it's, it, we, we'll, we'll book and ourselves nicely because um, I've, I have got more experience of the Smurfs. Um, I have not read any Tintin. I was a massive Asterix fan. I absolutely adored Asterix. Now, whether that was what precluded me from picking up Tintin, because there's always, I think there's a thing about having a huge range of somebody's adventures to pick from. I used to love it, you know, I think I've mentioned on the podcast before, going into a bookshop and seeing that there's 24 Tarzan books or there's 18 Conan books or whatever it is, 11 Bond books. You know you can work your way through them. And I think I probably, if I'd, if I'd had the time and money to read all of the Asterix books, I probably would have moved on to Tintin. But there was always another Asterix book to read. So I never... I I'm aware of the art and I'm aware of, you know, how gorgeous it looks. Um, I remember the TV show, um, oh, I don't the cartoon. Seen. There was uh, a cartoon, I think. Was it semi-animated? It wasn't really animated, was it? Maybe I've just imagined it. I thought I'd seen a cartoon. I thought there was one, but it was more static. But Yeah, it could be. I, don't, I really don't know. It's, no, it's one of those maybe I've just imagined a cartoon. But yeah, I haven't read, haven't read Tintin. Um, the thing with the Smurfs was um, I remember the merch first, I think. I, yes. I do remember reading Smurf comics. And I remember the Smurf, you know, the Smurf song, which was annoying. Please don't. But, <laughs> <laughs> but my dad... Uh, well, my dad worked in a garage um, and there was a giveaway in the 70s. Uh, I think it was Jet um, Garages would have um, Smurfs. If you if you paid a certain yes. amount of support. No, amount of I remember these. I do. Yes. You got these Smurf models. Oh, yeah. 
and th- they were giveaways they were free so you, you're spending your money anyway but you could go in so i remember going in with my dad when he's paying for his petrol and there would be this these lines of 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 toys and you could pick one and they'd just give it you so i remember my having sister collected them so they're all over the house yeah yeah i remember having you know boxes of them and they were, you know they had a king smurf they had the brainy one they had you know you had smurfette the girl there was a one i had who actually was in a car and there were some bigger ones i think obviously if you were filling up a lorry maybe i think there was the, the bigger they were i think the more you had to more petrol you had to buy <laughs> to get them but i i remember yeah the the the, the toys and it was a big deal you know you, you 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 had them and you collected them i suppose I, I never did football stickers so i suppose but i did smurfs i do remember the comics i remember them being you know exquisitely drawn but i i don't remember ever them you know particularly engaging them they only seemed to have one villain which was that monk guy who um, was was always bothering them uh, there was I think there was, I seem to remember a cat, an orange cat or something. I think, I don't know if they were drawn by the, the same team that did Asterix, but there was a, there was something in the, in the drawing style that reminded me of Asterix. So I think that was a big attraction. But, you know, I didn't have many, but, but I had them and, uh, you know, it was mainly. I'm pretty sure I had, do you know, a, a refill? blank paper pad mm. for school yeah i had the smurfs on and i yeah. still didn't really know what they were but everyone yeah. else seemed to know yeah and it's just i don't know it's a, an odd it was, blank for me this it is an odd thing that you you could have this thing that is so big and you know you'd get merch and you get songs but i i, I don't fundamentally understand the concept of them <laughs> even <laughs> though i had the toys you know what i mean <laughs> It's uh, well, weird. You've, you've... I think you're going to have to leave your stall again um, <laughs> or, or at one o'clock till two p.m. because I think we need to know this. Um... <laughs> but it, it's it's like I was talking to the girls the other day about you know you 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 understand fundamentally now uh, or it seems culturally that people understand enough about Batman and Spider Man that you can make a movie and not include the origin story. Yes. It's pervaded enough, uh, but. Um, you know, I, I've never read a Tintin book, but I, I do still somehow know that he's, uh, in, like you say, an intrepid adventurer. Is it sometime reporter, I want to say? You know, and I know some of his supporting cast, Captain Haddock and the Thompson twins. And, and I know all of these things, but I've never read a Tintin comic. Mm. I don't actually know what the Smurfs are. I don't, I don't <laughs> know if they're a science experiment. I don't know if they're... <laughs> a secret tribe i just know they're blue and they live in mushrooms and i had yeah. some toys about them when i was younger but i don't i don't know for all i know they're, they're clones i mean um yeah science experiment gone on i don't know and that's quite well, weird that that, that's the only other fact i know about them is, is that i have no idea what their breeding cycle is but there is only <laughs> one female smurf yes. <laughs> so how does that work i don't know yeah, it's, that, that's it's strange. That worries me to, from the offset, but um... isn't it strange? You know that the, there's this phenomenal, uh, the f- uh, a cultural phenomena that takes over in the, you know, into lots of areas of your life. But I don't know who, I don't really know who, who or what they do. I, I, th- I thought there was going to be a bit of a resurgence of Tintin. Actually, um, d- have you seen the 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 newer animated film? No, it's no. actually very good. Yeah, it's got everyone it's in there. Really quite, it's it's a proper adventure yarn. Mm. It, it's a real throwback to yester, to a yesteryear way of telling adventure stories. And mm. um, but I remember when it came out, of course, the controversy around Tintin came up as well. So I don't know how it did at the cinema. Um, Jamie Bell, I think, was possibly doing the voice of Tintin. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it was it's, it's a good watch. We've actually watched it a few times now. Mm. As it's Simon Pegg. Nick Frost, isn't it? Aren't, yeah. Aren't they? Um, you know. No, there's lots of the good things. Twins, yes, of course. It's got what's his. You there's know, some um, really good, good, good voice actors in there, actually. Um, in fact, that was one of the games we played when we first 
watched it. it was, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you weren't allowed to look it up on IMDb until after the film. It, there's a few animated films where we do that, and you're trying to figure out who's doing yeah. what voices. Yeah. Oh, God, you get it so wrong sometimes <laughs> on somebody that's so recognisable. But, um, no, it's, it's worth a watch, actually. Yeah, it's got, it's got all the right people in that. But there's, no, there's only um... one other thing I know about Belgian comics, uh, and it's more of another case of something I know about but know nothing of. Mm. Um, and I am I was a big fan of the French uh, Metal Holon, who or mm. Heavy Metal magazine, as we know it. Well, I know that there was a Belgian version. So I've heard it talk about, and I've read it about, about it in interviews and stuff. But the reason why we don't know anything about it is because unlike Heavy Metal, that was translated and then it was um, serialized over in America uh, in a different format. Um, they never did that with this one, despite the fact it's a very well. It's a Belgian version, is what I always got told. Um, it's a souvre, uh, French for to be continued. Um, and when I actually looked this up, I recognised most of the people in it. Because they're all of the of the era, um, which is like late 70s to late 90s even. They're all the same people from Heavy Metal magazine, and they are all French or Italian. Mm. There was two Belgium artists that were that were shown to be prominent writer uh, artists, writers or creators for it. Um, but all the others are ones you know, um, Alexander uh, Jodorowsky and Mobius, who did the Incal, which I've, I've done a Mike's Mutterings about. Um, the Vittorio Giando, um, Jean-Claude Forrest, um, who did Barbarella. Um, they're all recognisable names to me of, of mm. an era. Um, so yeah, I really do need to go to this because I really know nothing about mm. Belgian art. Um, I have a feeling it might be sort of um, political stuff. I've, I've just got that feeling that it's going to be one of those countries that has a big political art scene. Well, uh, you know, when I, I was know. reading about it, there was there was there was a few a few European comics that I new or, or characters that i i knew and some of them without having read them but you know just having a knowledge of 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 other comics out there you know i knew tintin but i also knew um, lucky luke never right. read any lucky luke yes that was the only Cowboy. other there was that and rick yeah. hoche were the only other things that, that came up the only thing i recognized i recognized lucky luke um i know cinebook the publisher uh, I've got a lot of Lucky Luke books and I've been reading a series from them um, about Long John Silver. So I, I tend to, I was buying a, a book. So, I, you know, um, every from the, when I'd go to a con, I read all four books of that. So I had decided that I was going to get a Lucky Luke one next just to fill in my gap. But I didn't realise that he, it was a, a Belgian cartoonist who created him. Uh, the Asterix cre creator uh, Rene Cassini was um, in a partnership with him for a while, and you know um, that it's one of the, you know, obviously it's one of the best known and best selling comic series in Europe. Been you know uh, translated in numerous languages, eighty one books so far. So you know I he's he's lasted a huge amount of time and he's obviously a huge figure in european comics didn't realize it, you know it, his belgian links but um yeah i think um i might start my belgian comics education with uh, with a lucky luke next uh, next right. time it's, the books. i think it was, was it early this year or last year i, I did a i did a mike's mutterings on on french comics Mm. Which is which is one of the reasons why I know a lot of these people because I really love heavy metal. But the great thing about French comics is there is publishing houses out there. They have a real vibrant comic scene, and these publishing houses are actually dedicated to. Hey, I think the English speaking world might appreciate them, mm. uh, and then they go on and do other languages as well. And uh, I I just don't know if there's a a similar uh, Belgium. 
type publishing house that's gonna that's doing the same thing so mm. i'm kind of intrigued to know but mm. that's the great thing about the festival it is international um and i like the fact that they pick a couple of countries each year to kind of invite over yeah. uh and educate you on uh sometimes it's stuff you know and you're interested in going and then sometimes like this it's something you don't know mm. so even more interested in going now yeah no it, it it's it, it's good to be spurred into different directions so uh, I will be partaking of uh, Lucky Luke in the future, I think. Well, we've covered off yes. five events that kind of caught our eye mm. and, and possibly aren't the biggest of events either. Um, yeah, it's a good cross-section, I think, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, there's, there's so much on this year. Mm. Um, and the official um, festival guide is actually available online. Um, and that explains exactly how to do all your tickets and the different options. Uh, I believe, is it the, the Friday might be a separate add-on to the tickets, and then you can get day tickets or weekend as well. Yeah. Um, but it's all there on the website anyway. Um, so we're going to do a part two where we're going to pick another five <laughs> random <laughs> events. Uh, uh, and I'm hoping that, that we can actually say something intelligent about them, unlike our <laughs> final topic, where we're both as clueless as each other. Yes. I, I, I started making some notes. There's still gaps. In, I tell you what, there's still some, some gaps. It's amazing when you start looking at a program and you are, you know, like we've said, confronted by... You know, we're both passionate about comics. We've both been reading comics for donkey's years. But to find that there are still those areas, still those rocks to be unturned, still those, you know, artists and stories and characters to discover, you know, it is is never ending, never ending journey into comics. I think the banned and censored comics is going to be a bit of an eye opener, um, because again, I there is a political class of comic, which is definitely not mainstream. But that seems to be the more controversial areas. And I think you, you always read really interesting stories about countries that a comic artist tries to publish something so outlandish. So I'm kind of hoping for a bit of that from from that. Well, my eyes a bit. Yeah, I mean, um, when I had Brad Brooks on, who co-wrote the sort of encyclopedia of world comics, I, I dug out my my copy and had a look through. And there are definitely some countries, um, particularly in South America, I think Argentina, that yeah. do have a real history of that kind of political, you know, impact through creators, through comics, through all forms of media that, you know, really do have some, you know, I suppose sometimes heartbreaking stories of, of there's Salvadorian artists that were executed mm. during the sort of yeah. the 1980s death squads and stuff. Yeah. 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 So you know there is there's 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 loads there's loads still to find out in that area definitely. Right. Well, uh, as Mike said, we will be um, supplying a part two uh, soon. Um, well, we'll carry on going through the uh, do five more areas of the program. But if you have made it, as we always say, to this point in the in the in the Mutter Downs, congratulations, uh, well done, congratulations, well done, and uh, we will be uh, yakking probably for this long again next time. Thanks a lot. Till then, cheers. You hit the two-hour mark on the spot, then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Find out more about the festival at comicartfestival.com. Find out more about the show and how to contact us at comicartpodcast.uk. Find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Music composed by Pop Noir.
This podcast is part of Brit Pod Scene, an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritPodScene.com or BritPodScene on Twitter to find out more. Oh.